I'm Larry Bishop, and you're listening to the World is Wrong podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about the Ben Stiller Show. <laughs> Welcome to The World is Wrong, an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists the world is wrong about. My name is Andras Jones, and I am but one of your hosts. And my name is Brian Connolly, and I'm also a host of this show. That makes two hosts of this show, and we are they. And this <laughs> is not Mr. Show. No, this is the birth. This is the birth of, of 90s comedy, I think. But we'll, we'll get yeah. into it. We're talking about the yeah. Ben Stiller show. It's a... Uh, it, it had only had one season, but we're still feeling its impact to this day. Are you still feeling the impact of it, Brian? I think about it uh, more often than I probably should. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that you <laughs> are you like me and that you are fairly often referencing this show in conversations with people who have never seen it and so do not know what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but it, uh, yeah, I'll definitely like do like one of the Charles Manson quotes, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, do, or do the do it, do yeah. it, no, 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 do it, <laughs> and that's just sort of like in my, that's just in the way I talk, the you know, in life, and and I think it works. I think it doesn't matter if you've never seen the show or not. It's just like I make sure I put it in a context that. Uh, I don't, I'm not just randomly saying these things in conversations. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's shut your stinking trap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really need to explain that one afterwards, usually. Though. <laughs> but no, yeah, this is this definitely a, a show that's kind of been like rewatching it for this episode. This is a show that's definitely like lockboxed in my mind forever. Uh, it just I think it was, it's just there for eternity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, let's let's play a, let's play a clip from it, and then we're gonna just get into talking. We're gonna close out the year, Gregorian twenty twenty one, with a celebration of this simultaneously uh, beloved and obscure show that we that we love. So let's let's hear what let's hear what uh, Dennis Miller has to say about these cats. <laughs> There might be spoilers. Yeah. There might be spoilers. Yeah. There might be spoilers. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm Ben Stiller, and uh, our special guest this week is Dennis Miller. Dennis. Hey, Ben. Thanks for doing the show. It's Thanks great for having me here in the Valley of the Handheld. I'd like to uh, say hi to you, the six to eight people out there who actually watch this show. Yes, you, Mr. and Mrs. America, out there on Channel Pi. In Minnesota. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in tonight. One of the few shows in America that makes me feel like Jimmy Arness ratings wise. Hey, I have the mange on a little packing crate material. I think it's from Sony Trinitron. All right, we're here with Dennis Miller. And Dennis, I'm, it's just really great to have you here. It's Thanks, really exciting. Uh, have you seen the show? I seen? love the show. Oh, quite yeah. the little comedic star chamber you've assembled here, my <laughs> friend, huh? I love the cast. You got uh, Janine Garofalo, Little Miss Post Everything, Lucy Van Helsing to Robert Smith's Count Dracula, Wild Hairdo, sort of like Peter Gabriel on the Foxtrot tour with Genesis. Yeah. Yeah, Andy her. Dick. Andy Dick, Martin Short stretched out on a rack for two and a half, three hours. <laughs> Andy, great name. Don't change it. Look good on a marquee someday when you're doing films. Parents show up, think you're doing gay porn, okay? <laughs> Um, uh, well, so we Bob got Odenkirk. Bobby Odenkirk yeah. used to be a writer for Saturday Night Live, a That's faceless right. scribe. Now out in front of the camera and still can't meet any women at all. Ouch. Well, that, about, that about sums up the cast. No, you. Right at the hub. The guy, man. <laughs> You're the man. Thank you. Also had a cup of coffee at Saturday Night Live. Bailed out when he found there was no <laughs> IN team. Headed up the river like Kurtz. Runs his own little microcosm of the world up there. Damn it, the rules are just what he wants them to be. Got himself a little caster on him so he doesn't look too autocratic. But don't get too funny, kids. Might be Hoffaville. I love the show. Thank you. All right. Well, that, let's go to a little film. Good. That's your part. Go ahead. <laughs> Ow. 
You know, Dennis, I just want to say I was a really big fan of your show. I thought it was great. You had interesting people on, and just I'm sorry it's not on the air anymore. Oh, well, thanks, Ben. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Hey, and you know what? I'm, I'm telling you, there are life lessons to be learned out there after a cancellation. You really, you know, you get on the other side of that pain, and I think you find out something about yourself that you don't know. So don't fret about cancellation. It's, it's you know, it's an opportunity. You should view it like that. What did you... Did you, Ben? Did I've you heard hear nothing. Something? I've heard nothing. Come on. But you know, you don't have to be quick-quick to read the bones here. There could be a chance here. You know, I'm not Kreskin, but I got my ear down to the track, and I hear the Silver Street coming. But you will rise above it. You'll be bigger, and you'll learn. You learn about your guts. What's in right. here? I'm looking this forward to that. Matter. Yeah, this is all. You know what? But I haven't heard anything about the Good. show. Good. Fox is as committed to it as they are to Herman's prostate or whatever the hell that show is. <laughs> All right, why don't we, why don't we go to this? <laughs> Skank will not be seen tonight in order to bring you a special presentation. Fox. 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 Hi, I'm Foxy the Network Fox, inviting you to join me for a wonderful Fox program brought to you in full-fledged Foxorama. Oh, wah, bah, baloo, bah, bah, wah, bam, Fox! Movements have many beginnings, and they're generally only evident in retrospect. When it comes to the acerbic meta-comedy of the 1990s and early aughts, one of its most significant initiators was The Ben Stiller Show, which ran for one season, was canceled by Fox, and then won an Emmy Award for writing. Brian and I are going to thoroughly unpack the show and its influence in the forthcoming epic end-of-year episode, so I won't beleaguer the point here. Instead, I'll just offer a couple of preemptive corrections. First of all, although I refer to him twice in the show as Reuben Kincaid, I do know that this is just the name of his character in The Partridge Family and that the actor's actual name is Dave Madden. And uh, apologies to Dave Madden and his, his family. Also, throughout this episode, Brian and I refer to the individual segments from The Ben Stiller Show as skits. I'm aware that some comedy professionals take offense at this term, preferring to use the word sketch. Please allow me to assure you that we meant no offense to any comedians, nor to comedy in general. And that's basically it for my intro. Uh, Brian, before uh, I ask you how, how you came to the show, did you have any apologies or corrections you wanted to make? <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, you were perfect. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Why why do they not like the word skits? I've never heard that before. What's what's the offense? It sounds like something that you make as a kid. Like it's like something that a dismissive parent says, like, Oh, I saw your one of your skits. They're sketches, Mom. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> actors are so sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> not actors, comedians. And oh writers. my god, I can't writers. wait. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Great. <laughs> okay. So, being uh, the the youngster that you were that you were at the time this came out, how old were you when when you discovered the Ben Stiller show? I it was when it aired, which was what 90, 92. Two? 92. So I was uh, probably eleven years old when it came out, and I want to say it was on the same night as The Simpsons. I think it was Sunday night is when they premiered it. That, that seems right to me because like that's how I watched it was I was tuning in to watch The Simpsons and then this was on like I think right before it. I want to say this was like the 730 slot and The Simpsons was the 8 o'clock slot or somewhere in there. And I was instantly hooked and I saw the very first episode, the one that they aired. And it was like... Featuring this... the U2 rockumentary, U2 <laughs> The Early Years with Mr. Kincaid, yeah. Cape yes. Munster... <laughs> Michael Ferret, agent to Roseanne, uh, Roseanne Barr, and Gary yeah. Shandling, and of course yeah. the What Is Sexy com commercials featuring a very uh, a very young Jeannie Triplehorn. Yes, and it, it, I just instantly connected with the show. I didn't know who any of these people were at the time, but it just had it, it kind of it had that smart. You know, you can tell it was made by smart people. It was really funny. It was really current. But it also, it didn't feel like, it definitely wasn't the same thing that SNL was putting out. Even though I really loved SNL in the early 90s. 
and but it had like it just had this sort of cleverness to it and just sort of uh you know it really fit into this sort of angsty counterculture explosion that the 90s was kind of starting to have at the time 91 you know, had you know in 1991 Nirvana Nevermind came out so this is a year after that and it just like it just kind of fit in with this sort of like the things I was getting into at the time of sort of this post-punk sort of way of looking at things and you watched every episode I I did I watched every one that aired uh yeah I don't think they all aired but I definitely watched all of them and then I was one of those shows where I'd go to school I was probably in fifth grade at the time I think um and it was I just it's maybe sixth grade and I wanted to talk about it with people but not everyone had seen it and then I kind of had I think introduced some of my friends to it and then they re-ran it on Comedy Central about five six years later and I was just like well I definitely have to tape that so I put a tape in and I taped every episode on like EP to fit them all on (laughs) One, like all five and a half hours on one tape, so poor quality. But they marathoned it, and I had a bunch of friends over to watch it with me who I don't think had ever seen it before, and it was just like it all came back to me. I was like, I remember all these things, all these skits, and uh, and I had that. I wore that tape out until finally uh, the official DVD release happened. And, of course, you own the DVD. Did oh, you, yeah. Did you mourn when, when it was canceled? Was it? Did you feel... <laughs> Which it's, which had a greater impact on you, the cancellation of the Ben Stiller show or the death of Kurt Cobain? <laughs> it's weird. Like, I don't know if it's because when you're a kid, you don't notice these things or you just like, I never realized there were certain shows I was into that were considered failures or that were canceled because networks would just stretch it out or they'd rerun it. Like so many of like the cartoons that I liked as a kid, I realized I only had one season, but in my mind they were on for years and so I just didn't ever really occur to me that it didn't last. It just was on and then it was gone and then some new thing was on and I watched whatever that was. And I just never, I'm trying to think if there was any show at all where I was like, oh man, where did that show go that I really liked? Like, I don't think that ever really happened as a kid. I got more in tune with that when I was a teenager, but I think this just was good. It was happened. It was gone. And I didn't really think about it being canceled or not being canceled because, because then soon after all of these people were in other things. So just sort of like, I'm just like, oh, I'm continuing to enjoy these people in other stuff. So, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't really remember it just being gone. (laughs) Got it. Got it. Um, Well, my experience is a little bit different because this was the show that turned my friend Andy Dick into a star. And I, you know, I'd known him for years before this, and that's always an odd and exciting experience. You get a kind of vertigo. And then when it ends up being something that's so good, yeah, um, it's just exciting. So I, I, and that's also how I got to experience news radio. Um, ah. So those were, that was a, just a good and exciting time. And I'm, we're going to be talking more about my friendship with Andy later on in this episode. I, so we don't need to go into it too much. I think I probably didn't, I wasn't uh, in fifth grade. I wasn't, I, did, I wasn't watching TV <laughs> regularly on Sunday nights. So I only, I think I only saw a couple of episodes when it came out and I really just heard a lot about it. And then I think I might even have got some videotapes from Andy of episodes. But then for me, it was the DVD when I watched the DVD. And then when I watched the DVD, there's a special where they talk about the making of. And there's this part where Judd Apatow is talking about how he ran into Ben Stiller at the taping of Elvis Costello doing Unplugged, MTV's Unplugged. Mm -hmm. And I was at that show. I was in that line with them, (laughs) which again is that kind of vertigo about this film, because as a performer, as an artist, one hand, I'm very happy for Andy. And there's also this sense of, of like, how did I miss out on being a part of that? Because I was all like whether it was through Andy or being at this show or just like being around it and having so many people who were either 
in my life or adjacent to my life caught up in it. And then I remember, oh, it's because I moved back to Olympia to be with, uh, uh, this gets into a sad story. My, my dad got sick and I had reasons that I had to leave LA at that time. But I don't know. The, so th that's sort of my experience with this, this show is one of just as a fan being blown away. And then also as a person feeling this odd sense of, I don't know, like, like a subtle, like a, a shark swimming by your leg or something. Like I was very close to being bitten by this thing in one way or another, um, which is a, is a fun feeling. If you're, again, if you are, if you've worked in, I guess in any field, when you, when something kind of blows up next to you, it's a, it's an exciting experience. Uh, if you haven't mm -hmm. experienced it, then it, may, it then uh, I hope you do someday. If you're out there listening, <laughs> I hope you get to watch one of your friends become famous uh, in a really funny show. Um, <laughs> so why don't we start talking about all the the people who are involved in this? And I let, I think since we brought him up, let's start with Andy, because yeah. in preparation for this, I actually went. I'm in L.A. right now. I went and, and hung out with Andy last night to try and uh, just fill in some gaps uh, yeah which by the time of night where i was hanging out with them eh, it was a little bit more difficult to fill in some of the gaps but uh <laughs> he's doing he's doing okay but uh andy i've known him since um, we met in 1988 right after i'd done the film far from home with anthony rapp and he and anthony were um good friends from chicago and and that Andy was part of the Second City troupe in Chicago, or he did work with Second City. He and Dino Stamatopoulos were doing comedy together in Chicago around that time and making films. And so, uh, yeah, so when, when Anthony introduced me to Andy, I had the experience that I think probably everyone who met him at that point had uh which is that this guy is a pure comic the word genius is a is a word that is thrown around and it's not really appropriate in this case but it's it's the word i always used was the comic monster which is a kind of genius <laughs> like he can't like the the monster can only do what the monster does and in this case what this monster does is be funny so <laughs> that is really i mean <clears throat> He doesn't know how or why he is able to be funny. He just is in every single case. And that has a that's been a blessing and a curse for him. But in terms of meeting him, there was this sense. And again, I don't know if you've ever had this, but if you meet someone, I guess for myself, if you meet someone who's just incredibly talented and makes you laugh whenever you're around them, you cut them a lot of slack. <laughs> um, and that's kind of my experience with Andy. And so that's why we're still friends 30 years on. Wow. But what's your, when did you first, when did, uh, Andy Dick first be, uh, become someone you were aware of, aware of, I guess in this show, this, this show, cause he's, cause he, I think I like him in this show. Cause he is definitely the, the Jerry Lewis of the bunch. <laughs> like he has the rubber face. Uh, he's, he's the lanky guy. You know, the uh, the Dennis Miller description in that in that clip is very accurate. And I was already a huge you know, Martin Short fan. And that kind of spastic sort of comedian is one that I'm really drawn to. And he is definitely, I think, the the most at 11 in this show. <laughs> like he I think he plays the louder, the yelly, the, the nervous, the neurotic, like all the ones, you know. The things that I relate to on a daily basis, uh, <laughs> and and I just he's just really really good in this, and like from from his Woody Allen his mummy <laughs> character. You know, when Frank and Judy split up, I was you know I was I was shocked. I <laughs> we were devastated. I said to him, Frank, what are you thinking? She was made for you. Uh, literally. So are you two getting along? Oh, it, it, it's wonderful. She's a wonderful girl, you know. She wraps me up and, you know, I, puts me to sleep and I, you know, take a nap for a thousand years. We're very happy. Which is brilliant. 
to yeah. just him being the nervous guy in the uh, NWA parody that that killed killed Doug Shaggy. Doug, Doug Shaggy and him just in his house being like, I don't understand why are they hate me, <laughs> and. One of my favorite bits on the show with him, and it's not even a parody of anything per se, but it's the long bit where he's trying to defuse the bomb, but he keeps, <laughs> he keeps going to do other things. I knew you'd uh, love that. That is so... That, it's so good. And that's great because it's just a weird skit that's not a parody of anything in particular, just a trope, I guess. And like, yeah. And then after this, of course, there was news radio and then his bits in other movies, you know, like The Cable Guy or, you know, like, dude, where's my car? And he's just a very funny man. You know, I've always thought so. Um, you know, he's also Skank. He's also the voice of Skank. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> America's going nuts for Fox's newest comedy smash, Skank. Skank. You're home. Shut your stinking trap. People Magazine says he's lamb chop with an attitude. Where's my head cheese? Why don't you check behind the eggs? Why don't you... Ah, such a stick of trap. Entertainment Weekly calls him Archie Bunker with pink hair. Did he have the skank puppet still? Did he have it in his house? Um, so in the place where he's staying, <laughs> I was visiting him. He's hanging out in this sort of artist's uh, flat like in, uh, in downtown L.A. And he was like, you see all this stuff around here? See it? You see all this stuff? I found it all in the hallways. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't see the I didn't see the sock puppet and that was skank. So I don't I have a feeling he did not he has not held on to that. <laughs> it's so it's so maybe it'll end up in you know some museum of yeah, you know, the new Oscar oh. museum that they opened up. So you followed him from this and then news radio, and then you see him showing up in other films, but Unlike the rest of the cast, he never got to do another big. Well, he got to do the Ben. I mean, the uh, the Andy Dick show for yeah. MTV. Yeah. And but I don't think as many people saw that. I think it's brilliant, and I'd love to do an episode about that yeah. at some point. We actually, our friend who sent us the Brown Bunny commentary, also sent us every episode of the of the Andy <laughs> Dick of the Andy Dick show. So. We will be able to do that at some point. But knowing Andy, there is, and I, I there's even a, a piece of artwork that was on his wall for a long time, a, uh, several pictures of him with a note from Judd Apatow, basically saying, and Andy, when you're the good Andy, you're the best comedian in the world. <laughs> and I th and I feel like there's this sense of anyone who knows him of that con like the and maybe that's part of the comic monster because the monster is a tragic figure like everyone who knows Andy knows that he has the capacity to be the best and funniest person in the world if he could get out of his own way and he has not been able to do that and that <clears throat> you know sort of from the Paul Williams way of looking at art he has chosen the life over the art. And, uh, you know, that's that's Andy Dick. But in this, he is as pure. One of the things I was asking him was like, how did you get so ripped for this show, man? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Ben Stiller is supposed to be the guy with the, you know, he's showing off his chest. And then when Andy takes off his shirt in the show, you're like, Holy cow, man. <laughs> I was like, are you, were you, were you, I, I imagine the two of you in the gym together competing. And he's like, no, no, there was no competition. I just wanted, just, I wanted to be the sexiest I could possibly be. Like, well, you succeeded, Andy Dick. You did. You were, yeah. In the, the Beverly, uh, was it, was it, Be no, was it Malibu High? No, what's this in the, the high school show? Uh, Melrose Heights, 902-102-402. <laughs> yeah, so that's Andy Dick. And uh, I guess also I should just say I've also written lots of music with him. We've, we've, uh, we've made uh, several records together. Oh, and there is 
one other thing to, to say about this, which is something that I thought, but yeah, I confirmed it. So Andy brought Dino Stamatopoulos onto the show. And according to Andy, Ben didn't want Dino or any of Andy's friends associated with the show, which <clears throat> I understand. Uh, but in this case, a couple of writers dropped out to go work with for The Simpsons right before. Mm. And so he needed a writer. So he brought in Dino. And Dino has gone on to really amazing things. Oh, Anyone yeah. who's a fan of comedy. He was featured in the Dana Carvey show documentary. He was one of the writers on in that writer's room that featured Stephen Colbert and Louis C.K. And... Uh, what's the uh, comic Charlie Kaufman insult dog? wrote for that show too. Charlie Kaufman yeah. and what's the comic insult dog guy's name? Oh, Robert Schmeigel. Yeah, Robert Schmeigel was on it. Yeah, just a, like a, a, a real star chamber of <laughs> com comic talent, and that all came out of this, or at least uh, for Dino, it did. And many of the people who worked on the Ben Stiller show did go on to work for the Dana Carvey show, and so they really had two failed shows on their resume <laughs> very quickly but that they're probably still living off of in terms of continuing to work because everyone who worked on those you know knew how great those shows were yeah yeah and you can really see i can really see now like watching the show knowing dino's style knowing bob odenkirk's style like you can s sort of see whose bits are whose which is kind of fun like uh it gives it a Monty Python kind of yeah. Yeah. quality where you're kind of tracking which is the Michael Palin stuff and what's the Cleese stuff, what's the yeah, the different teams <laughs> that they wrote in. So uh yeah, so Andy brought so Andy brought Dino in and again, Dino's another one who has gone on to really uh really amazing things in the comedy world. If you ever watched the TV show Community, he played the character Starburns in that show. And uh, has gone on to start Starburns Industries with Dan Harmon. And they continue to do exciting things, including at one point being the network that hosted the Radio 8 Ball show. So as you can see, this show, this is going to be a very self-referential end of the year show. I just know, I know or have interacted with a, pretty much everyone in the show at one point or another. So Sorry if that becomes annoying. I can't help it. It's my life. And maybe I'm feeling the 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 whiff of Janine Garofalo coming because we're going to be starting now. Let's talk about her. And I know that she would, or at least her character, would mock me for dropping all these names. So she is so uh, so good on the show. Oh yes, it's, like it's just she's really good at playing these different characters, the impersonations, like her. Juliette Lewis, which he plays in a multitude of skits, not just yep. the Cape Monster, but she comes back in the Husbands and Wives parody, too. It's really good. <laughs> Ray. Tessa Ramsey's. Hi. Hi. Uh, Is there something wrong with my no, assignment? Oh, no. No, it was wonderful. It was great. You know, it, it was one of the most horrifying curses I've ever read. Oh, uh, am I blushing? No. Because your aggravation. Well, no, I'm not kidding. So much. You know, it, it, I haven't been that, that frightened since I saw the colorized version of Casablanca, you know. Uh, stop it. you I mean, it's kidding. nothing compared to your work. Well, you know, that line you had about you, blood is thicker than water, only it goes down a lot smoother. I uh, think that's brilliant, you know. I, my thanks. knees were knocking. You but know? I mean, you, you. And your skin will crawl with insects, and your brain will boil and consume you, and you'll drown in your own blood. I mean, it's just, it's, well, it's yeah, incredible. I'm, it's peerless. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> And she just has, she has that punk at it. Like she's like kind of the punk person here. Like she's the one that even in the little interstitial, like the stuff in between bits, like she's the one who's very, feels the most 90s in the good way. Like that kind of 90s that we were part of, like that sort of counterculture, punk rock attitude, the like the fight, the, the fuck the man, the anti-establishment sort of thing that she's the one, she brings that to the show. Um, and it's just so, so smart and so funny. Um. <laughs> yes she is yeah yeah she i mean she's the only <clears throat> regular female cast member so she kind of sometimes gets stuck playing sort of the straight man like in yeah. manson but but she's great 
She's great. Now, I uh, <clears throat> I, re- I found out just in reading all about this that she and Odenkirk were a couple. Oh. At some point in all of this. I never... you. Hmm. That is the stealthiest uh, star or comedy star couple that I, because I, that I've never heard. Now we're, we're breaking this news in 2022, <laughs> almost 2022. But uh, let's not define her by who she dates, but I, I, unless that guy happens to be really cool. And then it's kind of, you kind of imagine that would be a fun dinner, dinner party to go and hang out with <laughs> Odenkirk and Garofalo. And some, if I had been in L.A. at that time, I would have been invited to that party because <laughs> Andy would have been there and I would have been the guy who was helping sweep him out the door um, <clears throat> when things got weird. That was my that was my job for many years with Andy. I was the guy who they were like, could you get him out of here? And I'm like, yeah, we're, we, yeah, we're ready to go. <laughs> but who does that for you? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does that for me. <laughs> Actually, no. But actually, what happens when people want me to leave? They are not afraid to ask me. They're like, just you need to fucking go now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm good at getting people to leave, including myself. Um, but yeah, no. Janine Garofalo is the is when you go going back and watching it. She is kind of the MVP. Her high points are so great, and they're a lot of them are really deadpan, like her Sinead. <laughs> her, her Sinead O'Connor auditioning to replace Johnny Carson. Yeah. <laughs> Sinead O'Connor. I don't uh, want to tell a joke when there's so much suffering in the world. It's disgusting. In fact, you fat American swine make me sick. How sick are you? You better pack it in, you tosser. <laughs> That's one of my favorite bits. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she's great. Amish studs, she's fantastic in Amish studs. Yeah, and and what's what's sad about her is that this then led to her being on SNL like two years after this, and they just don't know what to do with her on SNL. She really on that. I watched that season recently. It was like the 1995 season. It was a weird season where we also had like Michael McKeon and Mark McKinney, and it was just sort of like a weird uh in between season but she's just kind of stuck playing like the wife like the lady like she isn't really allowed to be as funny and show the range that she has here on that show which is too bad um because i think she's so so good so funny but again another person that then started to see a lot in movies uh after this like i love her in wet hot american summer and and she oh, never so Stopped being kind of the punky anti-establishment sort of person. <laughs> like that is clearly who she is forever. Like she had a radio show, like where she's like she's very outspoken person with all her, you know, uh, you know, like everything she thinks about with politics and everything, which is great. Uh, so I'm glad that this is like her. She's still true to the way she was in her like early twenties, is how she is now. <laughs> what do you think about her and Sandy Wexler? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a good movie. <laughs> Like everybody. Well, I know you're a big fan. Uh, yeah, you're. I, I. That's one of the Adam Sandler films. I don't need a lot of convincing yeah. about. You know, that's that's a good. Yeah. I mean, there aren't many that I need a lot of convincing about, but that's one of the ones that I think it sort of fits in that middle ground of his work, where it's not the Oscar bait, but it's not the sort of bro yeah, yeah. humor. So anyway, uh, I just. I was trying to look at what Janine Garofalo... I was sort of like, she hasn't really done much, but she's working mm-hmm. every year. Yeah. Yeah, so she had her... So she had her kind of moment as a movie star. I feel like... So Ben Stiller went on to direct. Bob Odenkirk definitely was on a slow burn, even after Mr. Show, which we'll get into. But I feel like Janine Garofalo is the one... Like you said, she went on to being an SNL, and even though it didn't work that was a big gig mm-hmm. to get and she was started playing like the best friend in lots of just sort of playing yeah. that character yeah. being the 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 snide <laughs> voice of the yeah. 90s until sarah yeah, silverman yeah like she's came really along. good in romy michelle's high school reunion as that character um there's that weird movie with her and uma thurman was was that movie called i don't remember what that movie's called but that romantic comedy sort of thing that she did. I, you know, I hadn't really thought about it, but do you feel like there isn't room in 
in comedy for Janine Garofalo and Sarah Silverman? <laughs> because it does feel like once Sarah Silverman came along, Janine Garofalo lost some of her heat. I think it's, it's more another, just this... I, I, I hate to be getting into replacement. I think it's more just the but... sad state of Hollywood that like once a lady turns 30, they they are done. And they want to find someone younger. It's just, you know, dudes are gross. <laughs> that's, that's how it is. It's like, oh, you're 30? Well, unless you're Susan Sarandon or Mel Streep, we don't want you. Get out of Hollywood, please. Like, that's sort of the shitty way that Hollywood works with women. Like, men, you can get old and ugly and still be in things. But women, they just, you know, they, as soon as you're or old and in their mind old is 30 <laughs> it's replaced they replace I don't feel you. I don't feel like I don't feel like I'm not I, you know I, just, I I don't think that applies to comedy I just don't I think if you are like there's plenty of comedian like that may ap- apply to like ingenue actresses but I think I have a feeling that that there's probably something else at play here because as I said she has continued to work steadily she just, I, I, I'm i trying to remember the last time that she crossed yeah. my radar. I guess she, I'm looking, she did a lot. She was in an episode of Billions this yeah. last year. So, but like even a lot of the TV shows that I've seen that I'm, that she's done in the last 20 years, I don't really, I haven't heard of most of these. Yeah. Maybe, I, and I feel like I'm paying pretty close attention and a lot of them are wet, hot American summer bringbacks, <laughs> which are all so good. <laughs> I feel like there's something. Yeah, no, they're all good. It's just like there's not. Again, maybe she's not trying. As I don't know who I. I don't want to. I don't even want to suggest a, a reason. But that there was a moment when, and I, it just happens to kind of coincide with the arrival of Sarah Silverman, that Janine Garofalo was that character and also maybe i have the impression that sarah silverman is more out there than she is just because i subscribe to her podcast and see her posts all the time yeah so if i'm maybe i should subscribe to janine garofalo in fact once we put this out we will because we're talking about her and she's going to listen to this and be like what are you talking about i'm working my (laughs) ass off and he's right hollywood is sexist and stupid and so are you and that's what I say. Thank you, Janine. God, that's what that's what I want to hear more of in my life. So uh, let's talk about her boyfriend, Bob Odenkirk. Do you think she brought him to the show? Well, he was on SNL before. There was a writer before this. So my guess is he. Right. You know, he's always been known as just this great writer. And this is the first time where he was really allowed to be a performer in anything. Um, and he's amazing. Like, he's definitely like the coolest person on this show. Like he just has that dry, cool thing that he's always had here. And and like his characters on the show are my favorite in his bits. Like Charles Manson is masterful. It's time once again for Ask Manson, starring America's favorite answer man, Charles Manson. Our first letter comes from Beth Del Monte from Wichita, Kansas. Dear Charles, I have three rambunctious children. How do you remove a tomato stain from a Persian rug? You can't get a stain out. You think I'm the stain. They, they say Charlie is a stain and they try to rub me out and put me in a jail cell. Only you don't, you just spread me around more. I'm inside your children. I'm a stain all out there in the world. I'm not just locked up. You're locked up in the prison. I'm free. I'm, fl- I'm floating around and looking around. I like it up here. You should try some lemon juice. Ask Manson was brought to you by Happy Children's Toys. Fun for all ages. Yeah, that's <laughs> and the that, high point. And what's I great is all, the... you, can, and you can really tell when watching this that you can see the Mr. Show, like what you can tell, which are the bits he wrote, because it feels so much his voice and like the, the way, mm-hmm. like the, his kind of humor. And like, yeah, like all that Manson stuff is so quotable. <laughs> it's so good. And, but then I also really love him as sort of like the uh, Leather Daddy and the Beverly Hills 90210 parody. <laughs> Last time on Melrose Heights, 90210-2402. Pardon me, I need to fuel up. Spider, did you hear? Vaughn is a robot. 
I am not a robot! And now, the conclusion of Robot Go Home. You know, <laughs> yeah. I am not a robot. <laughs> that's really, yeah. That's that's what that's one of the things I say all the time. If people don't know what I'm yeah. talking about, and <laughs> and I, my favorite skit, I think my favorite skit in the whole show is where it's him and Andy Dick in the museum, just like just talking how shitty all these extinct and uh, these uh, extinct cultures are. Yeah, uh, and just the line "Homo sapiens are number one" <laughs> is a really great, <laughs> great line. And I don't know, he just, he, yeah, he's just really cool. He's definitely like the, uh, just the, the, like he's, he's like, he's the, he's the cool one. Like you can tell that he's like, he is the, maybe even the smartest one on the show too. Like you, like he just seeps talent here and I'm glad, and like, I'm glad that like the slow burn that is his successful career has happened because like he is one that like whatever he's up to that's been the thing that i'm into like since the ben stiller show yeah yeah it even even with mr show which uh so good and <laughs> we could do another episode just about that but even on mr show i felt like david cross was the one who hollywood decided was going to yeah. be the star out of that even though if you've been watching like for me it was always I always liked Odin Kirk. Well, whatever. I don't want to split them up because they felt like they were great. But I always, because of the Ben Stiller show, had this strong affinity for Bob Odenkirk. And then when David Cross became the big star out of that one, it was another sort of head scratcher of like, what's what's going on with the? Is the world potentially wrong? Because in, in the back of my mind, I'm like, someday we need to. There needs to be a podcast that explores this. Uh, but. I, th this made me think of a thing that I went to several times in LA, a thing called um, The Other Network. There's an LA, I've actually found an LA Times article about The Other Network shows in LA at this time. And what they would do is they would show unaired pilots. And they actually had a night just on Bob Odenkirk. They had a, an Apatow night because he had many un, uh, never made pilots. And there were several that Bob Odenkirk did. And uh, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit uh, about some of them as sure. written about here. Uh, okay, so the February 7th, sorry, the February 7th screening features Odenkirk's unaired sketch comedy pilot, Next, produced by, and that's Next with an exclamation point, like, Next! <laughs> uh, produced by 20th t uh, TV for Fox in 2002, Highway to Oblivion, produced by and for Comedy Central in 2003, and Life on Mars, produced by and for HBO in 1994. Next recalls a sketch comedy show in the British style, freeform and associative, though only intermittently funny. Huh, that's the LA Times <laughs> is saying. I thought they were all funny. <laughs> Highway to Oblivion and Life on Mars are worth catching, if only to marvel at what it would have been like if they had actually gone to series. Both are panicky and suffused with a weird sense of dread. Are you excited <laughs> about this? Because I am. And darkly funny in the way that can keep you up at night. Highway, which is structured exactly like an e-true Hollywood story, is about a celebrity-obsessed delusional loser who leaves his hometown for Hollywood after briefly meeting the actor Dave Foley, who plays himself post-news radio. Erskine takes him up on a casual, insincere invitation to look him up if he's ever in town. I guess Erskine being Dave Foley, uh, and that's what ha that's how it ha that's how it all happens. He follows Dave Foley out to Hollywood, and then Life on Mars is a surreal, meandering drama comedy starring Janine Garofalo and Odenkirk as Hollywood writers who hang out at a cafe and organize a poetry reading for their idol, a Warholian protege, Luke Cage. There is no speedier way to describe life on Mars and life on Mars than as the anti friends, and it would have premiered in the same year as that show, which would have only added to its thwarted evil twin potential. <laughs> I want to see these shit. They sound great, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that's the thing. It's like so out of the sh so out of the Ben Stiller show, Bob Odenkirk, who is the coolest one, as we we say, he goes on to just fail. I mean, I mean, did he, Mr. Show yeah. happens, but even 
as the guy in Mr. Show, he can't get these things picked up. Yeah, it's uh, he's he's the true writer of the bunch. He's truly the struggling Hollywood writer, you know? And I think that maybe adds to why he's like on this show. He seems, and on Mr. Show too, he has that dry kind of, not mean, but definitely sort of like the, the he is that, you can tell he's a, kind of a jaded guy. Or maybe he would rather not go to the party, but go home and work on the thing. Like he just has that kind of air to him. And <laughs> and I, I respect that. Like I think, and I'm glad that eventually he became, you know, this big star. Uh, and uh, honestly, out of all these people, the biggest star currently, which is totally unexpected. <laughs> yeah. We can, we can get into that after we talk about Ben Stiller, but like that's. Well, yeah. I, I am, uh, I am kind of curious. When do you think, where do you think it happened for well, the think, world? That the I world th- decided that Bob Odenkirk was I think was it's definitely the kernel, like the seeds are there in Mr. Show. Like Mr. Show was such a popular like thing in the late, that was late nineties, early aughts. Right. And that was just such the thing that like was the coolest thing to watch. Like that, like, there was before it was on DVD. That was like tapes traded. So he was definitely like this really cool guy, and we all thought he was this really cool guy just from that show. And then he just kept working. He kept being in things, acting in things, and then it was definitely him in Breaking Bad, <clears throat> and and being like everyone being like he's on this cool, edgy new show. He's actually a really good actor. And then clearly it clicked not just with audiences, but also uh, the creators of Breaking Bad to be like, that's the character we now want to turn into its own show, you know? And then from there, he's the star of movies now and is the Bob Odenkirk. Like, he's nominated for Emmys, you know, for Best Actor. And he's just a beloved, <laughs> beloved man now by by most everyone. Like, Yeah, when he had a heart attack scare, yeah, everyone, like, yeah. like the whole world yeah. went nuts. No, it's just he just became this very loved, like... And I, don't know, I think it's just the thing, too, of, like, I'm not friends with him, but it's, like, that thing of, like, I'm glad that guy finally became this thing that everyone loves because I've always loved him and always stood by his work. And to find it, it's broken through that he's a bigger star than David Cross. He's a bigger star than Ben Stiller in 2021. Like, but it's because he just worked really hard for the last 30 plus years, you know? Like, that's, like I said, a true, hardworking Hollywood creative, you know? Where you just you never give up and you fail and you fail because once you when you're a writer, uh, you're just you're more you get more fails than successes. You just get so used to rejection and failure, and either you quit and you give up, or you just you just power through till death. <laughs> and that's just what he did. He just kept doing it and kept doing it. And then then he also became a very good director too. So like he just was always working hard. Yeah. 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 One of my favorite roles of his is uh, a role he played in, I think, the only film that Andy Dick directed called uh, Danny Roan, First Time Director, that I wrote a bunch of songs for with Andy. And in it, he plays this character, Danny Roan, and he's pitching his idea to Bob Odenkirk as a film executive. And he says, uh, so in a nutshell... The film is like this. And Bob's like, wait, 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 I love this. In a nutshell, what is this? In, I got to hear about more about this. What's in a nutshell? He's like, no, I was just <laughs> trying to tell you. Like, no, no, in a nutshell. I love in a nutshell. <laughs> and that's another thing that I find myself sh- shouting out that people don't know what I'm talking about. But he's his reading. He is just, he is such a great, because you say he's understated, but he also has this capacity to take it to like ex- be very explosive and to be very <laughs> silly as well. Um, yep. Yeah. He's so good. He's so good. <laughs> Which brings us to the star of our show. The guy who, uh, I, uh, Dennis Miller kind of jokes about it in that bit, but he does surround himself with some pretty amazing people. And that is, it's like a kind of confidence that he brings to this. I think that's part of what I love so much about, like he comes right out of the gate pretty much saying, I am super talented. I'm everything. (laughs) Like it's his confidence right off the top is so fantastic. Uh, Well, what's funny is that it's there, but also the show leans in hard with the joke of like that he's a loser and that he's a nobody. 
at the same time. Again, he's a sign of how confident he is. That's part, like, that's part of it. It's the only way it works. It's, and that and that's what makes it so good. Like he could have just been like, I'm this funny, talented guy, but the, but the fact that he breaks that apart constantly on the show, that he's constantly the butt of a joke, like especially in those bits of his video diaries, and he's just showing like this horrible moment in his life over and over again, <laughs> or whenever he has a special guest on, he is the heel. Like he is the butt of the joke always, and right. constant jokes about like who are you, like 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 this show's gonna fail, and like, <laughs> and I and think that's did. great. That's and it did, but but it's like I love like that kind of like that kind of comedy really works, and like that makes him more endearing, and it makes him you just you see that how talented he really is then, because if he was too confident, maybe you'd want to see him fail or something. I don't know. Because there's certainly comedians that come out just being like, I'm great. And then you're like, no, you're not. You're full shit. And then you ha- you want them to fail. <laughs> but, but I mean, Ben Stiller is like his his characters are legitimately great. Oh, yeah. No, it's and what's crazy is like it feels like with this show. I mean, with all these people, they all just kind of came out of nowhere. It's just like that great thing of. But it's but it's different. It's not like kids in the hall. It's not like these were people that were in theater together for years, honing their craft together as a comedy troupe. They just Ben Stiller and the producers just pulled together this amazing talent of 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 people, and it's great. That ben Stiller, much like Adam Sandler, is not afraid to surround themselves with people that are maybe even more talented in certain ways than them, and it just makes them look better. I think it doesn't make them look less funny. It just help, everyone helps each other out especially on this show. Um, but man, his range, like the characters he plays in the show, there's so many different types. Like he's a great actor. I think he's yeah. the best, he's the best actor in this show. Like, oh yeah. It's like the characters, like just starting off with him doing that great Bono. It was very difficult for us when we were starting out. We had this horrible old manager who didn't understand what we were trying to do with our music. I love those boys like they were my own sons. They came to me, you know. Oh, yeah. Mr. Kincaid used to drive us about in this ramshackled old multicolored school bus, taking us from gig to gig, screaming about how we were going to make it big in show business. Well, I was full of ideas back then. He wanted to get a little girl to play tambourine with us, but we nixed that one. With Bono, it was always about the message. So I gave him a message. If Joel Wasserstein doesn't have fun at his bar mitzvah, you're not getting paid. Comprende? Baruch atah Hashem, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natan lanu, Torah met. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I hope you're all having a good time here at Joel's bar mitzvah. We're all real proud of him. Look at him, the very vision of manhood. And how about Leo Krupnik? Who made that great gefilte fish sculpture, huh? Everybody taste the gefilte fish sculpture, it's great. Okay, Joel, get up here. Come on up here, Joel. And I hope everybody's ready to dance the horror and the hokey pokey soon. I don't want to see anybody sitting. Let's give him a hand, Joel. Yeah, today Joel is a man. Okay, Edge, play the blues. And it's so spot on, it's so funny. And it even has you know references to the uh, Rattle and Hum movie with the spotlight and all that stuff, and yeah, the impersonations are great, like Oliver Stone uh, doing the Oliver Stone Land, um, which uh, that's the Warner Brothers lot. Uh, the Oliver Stone Land that's totally Stars Hollow from Gilmore Girls and the Town of Gremlins, um, but like his Bruce Willis is amazing <laughs> in the Die Hard skit. Yeah, it's. Like all his celebrity, like his Pacino when he does the Beethoven audition <laughs> with, with Beethoven, I knew it was you, <laughs> breaking my heart. Uh, but then just the weird original characters, like the pushy guy who wants to make celebrities do stuff to his wife. The no, 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 do it seriously. Where he's where he's like just hounding, just like bothering Casey Kasem while he's trying to have dinner and making him dress up as a waiter. And that character, I love that character. Excuse me. Hi. You're Casey Kasem. You're unbelievable. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. Seriously, I'm telling you. You blow me away. Well, it's really nice of you to say. No, 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 no. I'm telling you what you do. It's really amazing. It's fabulous. Yes, well, can we get No, no, no. I'm telling you. I'm telling you what you do. I really get it. I get what's going on with you. It's amazing. Really. Great stuff. Yes. No, 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 no. no. Really. Do me a favor. Say, uh, coming in this week at number one, 
It's Lionel Richie, who's stuck on you, huh? No, I really don't think I can do it. No, 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 come on, do it. Seriously, do it. Come on, do it. Coming in at number one this week is Lionel Richie, who's stuck on you. <laughs> That's great. You get this at home all the time, right? That's great. All right, do Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Come on. Scoob, old buddy, old friend, old pal, I could really dig a pizza right now. <laughs> now, do you mind if we finish our meal? No, 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 do me a favor. Come over and uh, say hello to my wife, huh? No, look, my daughter and I are in a rush. No, 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 come on, gotta... do it. Seriously, do it. Come on, come over. You know what would be great? Get dressed up in the waiter outfit, come over, pour some water in a glass. Would blow her away. No, I can't do that. No, 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 come on, do it. No, I'd love to do it, No, 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 seriously, do it. Do it. And then there's the weird kind of Tony Robbins type character, the look at my teeth, they rule that, you. That's that, great. That's... <laughs> and he's just so, he's so confident in the show. Like Ben Stiller on this feels like, oh, this is must have been, it feels like when you watch Seinfeld, where you're like, oh, this must have been a guy who's been already working the scene for years and years and on The Tonight Show and all of a sudden finally has a show. But no, it really feels like Ben Stiller kind of just came out of nowhere. Like, yes, he had a very talented dad and mom, but like he is just so, so good. Like it. Like I wonder what do you know? Like how did he get the show? Like the the be able like whatever he came up with to convince Fox to do this show. It's like it's clear that he is very talented, and <clears throat> following his success through the '90s was really exciting to me because it allowed me to constantly remind people of this show. So when he was in. Like when Reality Bites was a thing that people really liked or when he um, was in uh, Flirting with Disaster and then when he finally broke Super Huge with There's Something About Mary. What was great about that is every time I can then tell people who were saying good things about that, have you seen his show? Have you seen the Ben Stiller show? Like that is really good. Like you need to watch that. And I think out of everybody, it's also kind of the saddest thing with him because he doesn't do this kind of comedy anymore. Like yeah. he like, occasionally does like, like Tropic, Tropic Thunder, Thunder was very much cool. feels yeah. like a Ben Stiller show thing, but he does, he doesn't really get to play these characters and he has such range. It's just sad to see that kind of squash to have him just sort of play a version of himself or the leading man, because I think because of the success of there's something about Mary, he forever got stuck as sort of like, you're this guy <laughs> in these movies and you're going to be that guy. You're going to just be sort of like the guy that bad things happen to when you have to fight, you know, Robert De Niro or whoever, <laughs> Jack Black or whatever, and always be. I bet he's kind of gone out of that. Now he's just directing and he's a great director. I mean, as you can, that's another thing about this show is that he directs, I think every episode or mo- a part no, of no. every episode. Actually, the, he does direct parts of every episode, but they do have, uh, other direct, there's definitely other directors, and you kind of get a sense. It, I'm just guessing here, but in the first episode or two, they are they're like this sec, this directed by this one was directed by Bob Odenkirk. These two were directed by Bob Odenkirk, and these were directed by Ben Stiller, and these were direct- and then by the third episode, it's just directed by. Yeah, and <laughs> I have a feeling that that was like a that they pro- there was some some decision on the production side to be like, no, 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 we're not going to do that game. <laughs> Although you can it, you can definitely get a sense of like, oh, well, like Bob Odenkirk uh, driving around and talking of buildings and women. That's clearly a Bob Odenkirk film. <laughs> yeah. Um, but and a lot of when you look at the directors, a lot of them went on to work on a lot of great comedy over the. the but the like he, his directing here is great. And then he soon after the show kind of became a bigger director first before a big actor. Like he did reality bites, but then he directed the cable guy, which he's not mm-hmm. even really in other than the Menendez brothers on TV. <laughs> and then like his career as a director is like, now he did that mini series on HBO with Patricia Arquette. Escape, and... to da- Escape at Danamora. Great. Yeah, so he's not making... funny at all, but so not funny good. At all. But he's a legit good actor uh, and a good director yeah. and as yeah. well. So it's just, it's it's great that he is always, I feel he's always had a place and will always have a place in Hollywood doing something. He seems like a very liked person. Yeah. And well, uh, Wes Anderson, definitely, I feel like yeah. he f- feels that way about Ben Seller. He let him do, like his character in the Royal Tannenbaum was, uh, that felt like a Ben Stiller 
show type character, although played for more sadness than laughs. <laughs> yeah, the more overly worried dad makes all yeah. the kids wear the same outfit just for emergencies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm with you. I wish I wish he did more of that. We didn't talk about one of like my favorite thing and is his Springsteen. That, <laughs> so good. My, my probably my <laughs> second favorite bit in the whole thing. So Manson the the Manson Lassie is the best. <laughs> it's like that's the top. Uh, but after that is just is uh, counting with Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just play it. <laughs> Hey kids, it's time for counting with Bruce Springsteen. Alright. What did I get up to? And it's funny that all the stories of uh they, they they do of him like you know doing the show at three in the morning and playing for hours and then cleaning up after the, everybody and then like curing like Andy Dick of his hangover or whatever <laughs> like just going through the whole pro like shave oh he gives him a shave that's what he does he gives Andy yeah. Dick's character a, a nice shave oh and- no but, <laughs> but the, my my is when he so my favorite is like when he takes Bruce Springsteen out like those are good but I feel like they're a little bit on the nose. Once they've introduced the character and then they have him cutting Gary Coleman's hair and <laughs> teaching us how to count, that's when I'm like in heaven. <laughs> Why did he make his Bruce Springsteen so ugly? Like they really make him not look well, like a, the, a good look. Because Bruce Springsteen in real life is a very good looking man. But here he just doesn't look. <laughs> he just makes well, him look kind of ghoulish. So I got it. So I feel like like so the makeup for the show is both great and terrible. <laughs> like the 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 bo- the Oliver Stone makeup, it all looks like it's fa- like it's caked and falling <laughs> off. <laughs> like it's very ugly makeup for most yeah. of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, and Some I really of them really work. What were you going to yeah, talk about? Like... The the about Tito Gallegos, the pig Latin lover. Yeah, because that, that also is one of the best things I've ever seen. Arrivederci Records is proud to present the debut of Mr. Tito Gallegos, the pig Latin lover. Order this two record set now and find out what the rest of the world already knows. Nobody sings songs of love in Pig Latin the way Tito Gallegos does. Listen as Tito brings Broadway into your home. This rare collection is available only through this TV offer. But for a limited time, feel the fire, feel the passion, and feel the spirit of this unique balladeer. So order now and discover why Pig Latin is the lost language of love. Okay, Aune. All Adrian may edit Cray Arts K accepted. And just like they would remember that much pig Latin. I know. It's that's... a lot. Like it's like it's not cut up. It's like him doing whole numbers, whole bits, you know, with Rip Taylor or whatever in Pig Latin. That's amazing. I'll play um... a clip of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's yeah, it's he's just so good. Like I love his uh his Sydney Pollock and the husbands and wives parody as Frankenstein's oh, yeah. monster. It's just uh and, what, and am I, show... what am I doing here? What am I doing? <laughs> And I think what's great about that skit and so many of the skits in this show is their commitment to just play it out for way longer than a show normally would. Mm-hmm. Like, they really are like, 
no, no, we're going to cut back as if it's a commercial break and we're going to still be in this Beverly Hills 90210 show. We have to, because we have to sort out the plot. <laughs> or like, yeah, it's just like that hanging in there for like a good five minutes to really settle in with the joke. And just how how spot on the parodies are. Like the Cape Monster, like so many of the shots that are just replicated from the Scorsese movie, uh, like just done really well. Or the Few Good Men parody that they do. Um, <laughs> the Cape Munster, which is when Eddie Munster busts out of jail. <laughs> it's like it, the idea itself is not funny. It's stupid. It's kind of, but, but, it, it, but, it's, kind of it's, it's, but it's like like why is it Eddie Munster? Like there's no reason for it. But that's why it's good. That's why it's funny. <laughs> it's like sure, it's Cape Fear but with Eddie Munster, and he's mad, and he's out now. Okay, but he's playing it like Robert De Niro in Cape Fear. He's not playing it like Eddie Munster. So just it's very confusing. But that's what makes it really funny. Oh, um, I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, and his obs- I'm guessing it's Ben Stiller, but this show is obsessed with 70s television actors and especially the Partridge yes. family. Yep. Uh, and like all, well, well, there's it cuz he's I'm they were probably the same age. It's all the same people that we would have been watching on TV. It's it's, it's Ruben Kincaid and Danny Bonaducci and yeah. David Cassidy. But we also got Todd Bridges and Gary Coleman. Yeah. And uh who else did we have? If Rip Seven- Taylor shows up, Rick Taylor, uh, was, Casey yeah. Kasem, Hervé Villachez, <laughs> Susan <laughs> Anton. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's just all these people. And, like, you'll oh, have, like, James Doohan on as, like, the special guest, the like Scotty from Star Trek. Uh, yeah, just all this sort of, like, you can tell that he was the cable guy. <laughs> ben Stiller is definitely the kind of kid who grew up with, TV, like, the TV age, you know, and you just watch and you just absorb all these these people, these celebrities from the the (laughs) seventies. I love that he does an impression of Mark DiCarlo for Amish studs in one of the early episodes. And then he has the actual Mark DiCarlo Um, on (laughs) because it could be a really, I feel like both, like both uh, Cruz and DiCarlo, but particularly I was, well, let's talk with Mark DiCarlo first, that the first time I saw that, impression i was like that's kind of (laughs) mean but then when mark DiCarlo's on you're like oh he must like it so it's not mean and it's the same with the tom cruise uh (laughs) yeah although the tom cruise is something is like an other level like he could he's born to play tom cruise he really he (laughs) no makeup like, that's what's so crazy. So he, he gets caked in makeup for Oliver Stone. But for Tom Cruise, he's it's like... It's just sunglasses. <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> well, it's just he just has the mannerisms. He just knows how to, like, do... Just do it just with the way he talks in the face. And the, the, so the, the behavior of a Tom Cruise. And that bit, that skit... I think that's maybe my favorite thing that Ben Stiller did on the show is that Tom Cruise review skit. Because it, it just shows his range of all the different types of Tom Cruises. Cause it's like, it's born on the 4th of July, Tom Cruise, it's risky business. It's top gun. It's like all the different roles that Tom Cruise played at that time, up to 91, 92. Uh, <laughs> and that, that's that, like, I just love all the different, like this show is so smart and it just, it's so aware. It's so self-aware of everything, just all the little things and just all, it really gets like whatever it's parodying, it really gets the minutia of it. Like in that Tom Cruise bit, my favorite thing in that is when he does the risky business thing and you hear the first bars of the song, the uh, old time rock and roll song. And he does this little like shrug to the audience. Yep. <laughs> he does this, it's, it's this little like, Hey, yep. you know, it's this thing. And just that little touch, it makes it so much funnier to me. Cause it could have just been him doing the bit from risky business in the underwear, but adding that little like nod of like, ah, <laughs> it's, it makes it even funnier. Cause like, that's something that you would see somebody do who had this sort of cheesy variety show. You like they would have done that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. There is a, one other thing about uh, Ben Stiller. I, I have a little Ben Stiller story. I I, I could share. Ooh, yes, please. So it was 1997, I think. And I was on tour opening for Dan Byrne, who was just coming out with 
his record, I believe it was a record called 50 Eggs that Ani DeFranco produced, but it might have been his first record. I, I'm, I'm blanking right now. But anyway, it meant playing like a lot of cooler venues. Like we we're playing the Great American Music Hall in San Francisco and just other other cool places. And part of that tour, we stopped in Portland to play a show in Portland. And in Portland, they were filming the movie Zero Effect mm. with uh, that was directed by Jake Kasdan. That was his directorial debut. And Dan was good friends with, I assume he is still good friends with Jake Kasdan. And he wrote a song for the film called Zero Effect. And, of course, Dan would uh, go on to contribute a lot of songs to the Jake Kasdan, I don't know, quasi-comic masterpiece, Walk Hard, with John C. Riley, And so uh, I we were we ended up just, like, hanging out on the set for, uh, for at least a day. I feel like it was two days. And, of course, Ben Stiller was in this movie with... Uh, Bill Pullman and Ryan O'Neill and Kim Dickens, who uh, you you remember from Treme. She played the the chef in Treme, the one who mm-hmm. loses yeah. her yep. her restaurant. Anyway, that was the first time I'd seen her, and this is a long way of going around to, to being like I was kind of excited to be on the set with Ben Stiller. But he was in this total, like, I think he was probably method acting because the role is kind of a dark, dour kind of character. And he was just like sitting off by himself with sunglasses on, giving off this air of, don't talk to me. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um <laughs> And I oh I don't want to say it may like I I'm an actor so I like I did I never take offense at that I don't think oh what a jerk it's like no he's at work he's working yeah, exactly he's at work yeah. I would anyone who went up and <laughs> penetrated that bubble unless they had a reason to on the set would be a jerk so I wasn't yeah. a jerk I didn't I didn't bug him about it but I think just going back to the actor thing I think that might explain that it helps me to understand. Ben Stiller. First of all, you don't get that good at all those characters if you're if you're driven by anything but building it from the inside and then delivering it. You you kind of have to shut out the world that is treating you like Ben Stiller to be come each of these different characters. You kind of have to do that. It's like what they said about Peter Sellers. I was actually kind of thinking about that as we were talking that I think Peter Sellers is the is the actor who Ben Stiller could have been if he were just slightly less handsome <laughs> and <laughs> and then got funneled into the leading man thing. Like if he had just kept doing the characters. And I feel like in that movie, which I feel like we should cover. Have you seen Zero Effect? I've never seen that movie. Oh, yeah, we should definitely cover it. It's it's my favorite Bill Pullman performance. It is a weird film. It is, I mean, I feel like Jake Kasdan has, is, is a pretty mainstream kind of director. He's, he's good and sometimes great, but he's never, I don't think he's ever been as interesting or as specific as he was with Zero Effect. That is a very unique film. Uh, yeah, we should definitely cover it. But uh, but we're talking about the Ben Stiller show. So one of the things when I'm watching the show is I'm trying to figure out when they really knew that they were canceled. Because they <laughs> in the Dennis Miller episode, they sort of tease that he knows that something is going wrong. So in yeah. episode 10... Like, it's just, I, I always like to track the evolution of a show. It's just interesting. So as this show is finding its legs, the legs are getting cut out from underneath them. <laughs> and so it's try, like watching is trying to figure out. And also because so much of the show's humor is self-deprecating. Yeah. That you can't really tell when <laughs> that really happens. Like, is, are, is part of it like a joke, which I could totally see doing. Like, we're going to make a joke about a show that gets canceled. And then in the second season... When we come back, that'll be part of the joke. 
<laughs> except that you accept that it all comes true. It's just, and, it, 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 <laughs> it's just this show and like the Dana Carvey show has the same thing. Like when you watch it, you can tell there's a point where they knew that it was just done. But that show also constantly made the joke that it, like, it wasn't meant to last. And it's just sort of like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's just the type of people who are in Ben Stiller's show, the type of comedy. It feels like they knew from day one that they were very lucky. <laughs> and that it, this show couldn't last. This show c- can't. There's not a world that exists where this is the hit show that all of America loves. Like this type of show and this type of humor can't be the thing that crosses over into a, you know, friends level type success of the 90s. Like it's just too smart and too weird that it's just it just feels like those things. It just feels like they are like the maniacs let loose and they're allowed to do the comedy and they just know <laughs> this isn't the type of, this isn't for everybody. This isn't going to be the number one show in America ever. <laughs> you know, we, I, I know we're talking about all these, these cast members, but there were a couple of other cast members who were heavily featured in the show who aren't usually, aren't usually credited. Uh, mm-hmm. One a major part of the the cast who by the end is being included in the cast hangouts Mm -hmm. is John F. O. Donahue. So they needed one old guy. He's like, (laughs) you're going to play all the old guys. (laughs) And he's great. That cop stories bit. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's uh, him just eating that donut and just telling some horrible story. Uh, Very good. It's time once again for John O. Donahue's cop stories. True tale of New York's finest. It was 3 p.m. My partner and I were positioned in front of the Olympic Savings Bank. We had gotten a tip that there was going to be a major heist at exactly 3.15 by a splinter group of the Jamaican Posse. This is the same group that attempted to blow up the president's motorcade, so we were ready for anything. Suddenly, I realized I'm supposed to be in traffic court. So I slammed the pedal to the metal, and I'm there in 10 minutes. I burst through the door. There's this little punk telling the judge that he stopped at the stop sign. I said, hey, you didn't stop. You were rolling. What am I, an idiot? I don't know the difference between stopping and rolling. You were rolling. Then you says, oh, you were just trying to meet your quota. I said, hey, I already met my quota, you jerk. What do you think? I wake up in the morning thinking that I'm going to give Gerald Friedman a ticket for no reason? Like I give two cents about your life, you dirtbag. Tune in again for another gripping adventure. I'm pretty sure he was rolling. Hey, if the badge says you're rolling, you're rolling. (laughs) On John O'Donohue's Cop Stories, tales of action from the boys in blue. (laughs) So there's him. Also, he plays the Grateful Dead insurance salesman, (laughs) the life insurance salesman. Yeah, yeah. And in, in actually in episode six, they put those back to back which I thought was kind of, I feel like that's when they decided that he was kind of a castmate. Yeah. Because you don't put two sketches with him lead, in the lead in it back to back Yeah. unless you're saying, okay, well, now he's not just a character. Yeah. Like he's not just one of the people who shows up as a, a small character. He's he's a featured player. Yeah, like, like, uh, like Paul Dooley's in the show too as just a character in a skit, but he's not like reoccurring. <laughs> right. And then the other one is Dana Gould. Yeah. Who, like, for the longest time, until I started researching this, I, whenever I watched The Grady's Oats, I always, was always like, okay, there's so much makeup in that. Is that Ben Stiller or Bob Odenkirk? I just can't tell. Well, it's neither of them. It's <laughs> Dana Gould. And those are some of the best things in the show. You know, this old house has been in our family for generations. For about as long as we've been serving Grady's Oats, instant oatmeal, with every breakfast. I live here all alone now, just like my Uncle Ray before me. Now, they say that he used to like to wait until it was really late at night. Then he'd slip into a pink taffeta gown, fill his panties with piping hot Grady's Oats, instant oatmeal. Then he'd dance around the backyard in the moonlight, stare into the neighbor's windows, and tell filthy stories to their animals. They say on a moonlit night, you can still see him out there dancing. <laughs> Grady's Oats Instant Oatmeal. 
It's a delicious way to eat and a nutritious way to live. Grady's Oats Instant Oatmeal. Available at fine stores everywhere. Right? Oh, yeah. And he's also good as that anti-Cupid sort of character, that just kind of gross, eh, just scummy character. And then he's, he's Jim Morrison in the uh, Oliver Stone land. <laughs> Bring on through! Bring on through! Uh, my favorite person in the show who isn't the main cast is Judd Apatow. And his Jay Leno. <laughs> That's Foxy. His, oh. His, oh, his Jay true. Leno is incredible. <laughs> it is it is done with such not love that <laughs> you can tell this is a man who does not think that Jay Leno is deserving of the Tonight Show. <laughs> Tonight Show auditions. First up, Jay Leno. I can't believe you guys are making me do this. You know you're going to give it to me. I mean, this is ridiculous. You know, I tell a joke. That's all I do. I tell jokes. You know, I don't do the tea time theater. I'm just, you know, I tell jokes. You know, I'm the home friends. Did you read the paper today? I mean, this is what I do. It's, it's pretty simple, really. I got it. They gave it to me. I got to show all that kissing up paint off. Time to kiss up to Mr. J. Oh, yes, it's all mine. This plan is mine. I'm going to get rid of Johnny's mug. Can we get Doc Severinsen on the phone? I have to tell him something. Very, very good. Uh, very funny. Yes. And his, his foxy, the fox, uh, the fox fox. <laughs> yeah. That's when it feels like the show is starting to realize that it's not going <laughs> to It's like, keep what going. just bite the hand that feeds us now? Like, who cares? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, other, uh, you know, Dweezil Zappa did the music for it. Mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Do we need to talk about Dweezil? He's another guy that was just sort of like became a little star in the 90s. And he had, if you, do you ever watch the show? It was him and his brother had a variety show, or it was like a game show. And I don't even remember what it was called, but it was only, that was only on for like eight episodes. And it was like a battle of the sexes sort of thing, but with celebrities. But it was sort of like if the man show was a game show, but hosted by Dweezil Zappa and his brother. And it's just very strange. And then they play called music. Happy Hour? Yes, Happy Hour. Oh yeah, that that show is amazing. That <laughs> okay. there may be a future episode about Happy Hour, you know, but like that is such a weird time capsule that show. And I don't know. There's something about him too that he, you know, he's the son of this you know creative genius Frank Zappa, and then he definitely has like the music sounds like a Dweezil Zappa thing. And yeah, it just kind of again it just fits with this sort of '90s counterculture sort of this group. Like is this this show was the first time that I feel like Hollywood made anything with these kind of outcast comedians. Like these aren't the people on SNL at you know really at the time. These aren't the now, famous ben comedians. Ben Stiller like, was on SNL. I mean, yeah, left, well, I mean, right? that's the thing. Ben Stiller was, and Bob Odenkirk wrote, and Janine Garofalo was, but it wasn't a fit. It didn't work, you mm-hmm. know, because they're part of this sort of L.A. alternative comedy scene that became the dominant comedies like this is pre like Patton Oswald and Sarah Silverman and all these people, you know, Paul F. Tompkins, like when that became sort of the comedy for every, like, and like, like, like before Judd Apatow was making movies and all these people like this, it, this show is sort of like the American graffiti of <laughs> alternative comedy. Cause David Cross even shows up on this show. Yeah. Right at the end. Uh, right at the end. So it's just like, this is that kind of like, even though this show wasn't the big hit at the time, it was the, the 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 trunk of the tree that all of this comedy came off of that became the comedy. It just was. It was maybe just a little too soon for it to c- kind of connect with people. Like it was a few years, few years too early. Yeah, yeah. Um, or it, you know, just right on time for. Yeah. You know, it was actually <laughs> perfectly zeitgeisty. It's just Fox yeah, didn't yeah. know what they were what they were dealing with. They actually won an Emmy after they were canceled for writing. (laughs) For which episode? I think it was just for the show. Oh, yeah. Well, best, best writers, you know, on, you know, a variety or comedy show. Yeah. I should look it up. Uh, Outstanding individual achievement in writing in a variety or music program for 1993. That would be Judd Apatow, Robert Cohen, David Cross, Brent Forrester, Jeff Kahn, Bruce Kirschbaum, Bob Odenkirk, Sultan Pepper, <laughs> Dino Stamatopoulos, and Ben Stiller. They all got Emmys. 
<laughs> and the Emmy goes to the team from the Ben Stiller Show. I can't believe it. Uh, somebody had to represent the Fox Network tonight, so we showed up. Uh, I, you know, we, we all worked really hard on the show. Not many of you probably know who the hell we are. <laughs> but uh, it was a great opportunity. I want to thank uh, all of our agents, our mothers, our fathers, our girlfriends, our wives. Uh, this, I can't believe I'm here. This is great. Uh, Judd, Molly Madden, uh, Jimmy Miller, everybody who made this possible, thank you. And the Fox Network, I think you missed, you know, something here. I mean, <laughs> anyway, okay, thank you. Good night. That's it's gonna so... be frustrating to be like, you win this award for best writing, but you're canceled. <laughs> well, from a writer's standpoint, it just means that your price just got, just went up, and now you're going to get hired to work on other things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it actually is nice to win. And I mean, if your show is going to get canceled, the least they can do is give you an Emmy afterwards. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the most they can do is give you an Emmy afterwards, really. So do you mind what I'd like to do? Oh, first of all, have we said have we, we talked enough about the, the cast? Yeah. OK, because we're still going to talk about them, because what I want to do now is I just kind of I, I, I went through and I watched all the episodes and we don't need to talk about every skit, obviously. Yeah. Well, not obviously, because we've done those kind of episodes before where we got that granular, but we're yeah. not going to do that here. But I'm just going to read out the skits for each one, and then may it, maybe if there's anything that we can just, like, highlights we can we can mention. Yeah. So I mentioned uh, episode one is the U2 rockumentary, U2 the earlier early years, Cape Munster, the first appearance of Michael Ferret, Agent, and the What is Sexy <laughs> commercials. We should probably talk at the, about the Michael Ferret, Agent character, because he shows up throughout and... He's the kind of character where so many people have done that character yeah. that it seems like a cliche, except that Ben Stiller does so much, so many cool bits in it <laughs> that it doesn't seem like a cliche. He's fantastic. All right, guys, can I just tell you something? As your new agent who you pay to represent you, I have to say this. You be illin'. Really, I got to be honest here. You've done the rap thing, all right? Let's move on. Come on, let's try something new. Let's break the bounds. You know, let's do a sitcom, all right? Come on, run. You rent an apartment. Betty White comes in. She rented the same apartment. Jay lives downstairs. Dee lives upstairs. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, she teaches you how to cook. Jay teaches her how to scratch. And, you know, it's great. It's perfect. It reaches everybody. I ain't gonna reach nobody. We ain't doing it because it's stupid. Word up, man. It's bananas, man. It's real stupid. <laughs> bananas. See, I love this. This is great. You guys have a whole comic thing happening. You don't even realize it. I mean, Run's playing off of Jay. Jay's playing off of D. You're all playing off each other. You don't even know. I mean, if the Marx Brothers saw you right now, they would flip. Right now, in their graves, they're, you know, they're doing, they're breaking. You know, they're doing electric boogaloo, and they don't know what happened. I don't even know why I didn't think of this 10 years ago, and right now it's hitting me. I'm saying, boom, talk show. Three of you guys doing a talk show? Forget it. That's why, you know, that's why Miller didn't happen. It was one guy. Three of you guys doing it? Forget it. Runs to the couch. Jay's a sidekick. D's, you know, leading the band. That's it. Boom. It's happened. It's over. And Leno has, you know, run away in the hills, hiding naked, looking for his mommy. I mean, this is what we're talking about. Hey, check this out, man. We just want to do our song, man. We just want to rock the mic. I hear that. Hey, I think Run said it best. You know, Jam Master Jay, he's the one in charge. It's up to him to rock the beats, which are truly large. But I got to tell you, I'm getting very big offers for you guys, all right? I just got an infomercial thing they want you guys to do. It's some product. I don't know. It cuts your hair with magnets. Magnets? Forget it. Fat Boys took it. You don't even want to touch it. Yo, we don't want to do commercials, man. We just want to rock the mic, like my man said. Hey! Who are we talking about here? We're talking about you guys. You know, you slay all suckers and perpetrate. You lay down law from state to state. I know that. I mean, look at it. Everybody's doing a bad impression of you guys now. You know, if I want to see an impression, I'll go see Rich Little at the Trop. I'm not going to go see NRA. NWA. Yeah, whatever. Hang on. Listen, Jennifer, uh, get me uh, two tickets for Rich Little at the Trop. You guys want to go, huh? We do a thing? No? Forget it. Anyway, we're doing the Ben Stiller show on Sunday. You don't want to do TV, all right? You're much bigger than television. You guys are major motion picture actors. Let's stop thinking with the little head, and let's start thinking with the big head. I mean, I'm talking about a major motion picture career for you guys. You know, why aren't you doing Batman 3, which they're casting now? You guys could play the villain in Batman 3. No problem, you know? Jay, just make up an animal. Jay, who am I? Ooh, I'm Koala Man. Yeah, I climb up trees, and then I scrape people, and I got a little fuzzy nose, and I go on an airline, you know? And D, why can't you do a... Uh... You don't even have to be an animal. Just pick something. You know, look, I'm Tree Man. Every day I grow a root, and then I go up the tree, and then I, you know, an apple falls off me. Ooh, the apple's gonna hit you. Scary. This is, you know, this is, you know, run. Excuse me, run. Danny DeVito playing the penguin gets in there. Ooh, look at me, I'm a penguin. No, you are a penguin. And I mean that in a good way. I mean, I look at you in a tuxedo, and, you know, I see the soul of a very lonely, lost penguin, and it's a beautiful thing. I'm just saying, think about this stuff, guys, all right? Really. You can do that, okay? We, well, just think about it, okay? Really, guys, just. 
All right? Listen. Peace out, guys. Right? Word to your mothers. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, when Tom Bosley gets out of the bathroom, send him in. I feel like this role is just as good as the do it guy. <laughs> I love it when he's talking to, I think it's Roseanne and Tom Arnold, that he goes to the treadmill. <laughs> like yeah. While he's talking to him, he goes and does just like a little power exercise for like 30 seconds. While he's, <laughs> while he's on another call with Dr. Dre. <laughs> And yeah, it's just like that classic kind of fast talking, like, you know, like character. But yeah, it's, it's funny. It's good. It's, uh, it is, it is clever. Uh, it's, it's very specific. Just... And like when he, when he's like talking, he has the bit with run DMC and he's quoting their lyrics at them. I feel like that's <laughs> just, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Alex Karras is another one of the characters, yep. one of those sitcom. Yep. From Webster. Yeah. And that's not really seventies. <laughs> that's early eighties. But uh yeah. uh okay, so then and that one doesn't have a guest, but then we get episode two and the guest is Bobcat Goldthwait. And that's where we get Tom Cruise dressed casual, Melrose the first appearance of Melrose Heights, nine oh two one oh two four oh two, the Tonight Show auditions that we we already talked about, the the first appearance of Skank. Very much it feels like and that's an Andy and Dino bit i just i'm, I'm sure uh, then it yeah then advantage agassi <laughs> <laughs> which has a great uh, ernie hudson role as sort of like the <laughs> the chief or whatever but he's sitting yeah. on one of those giant tennis uh watch t- whatever you call those things like the giant stand that... yeah <laughs> And then we get uh the first of the video diaries the van halen video diary which did you pick up the date on that one no it's another appearance of August 12th. Good Lord. <laughs> August 12th, 1982. Uh, what, where were you of... on your birthday in 1982? Were you looking to a Van Halen concert? No. No. No, actually. that. But I, I do have my own really sad story about that day. Uh, I, I, so my, I, my family, my mom, my, I was about to be leaving town, leaving Olympia to move to the East Coast. And it was my last soccer game with my soccer team. And it was the last game of the year. It was sort of like a playoff type game. Mm-hmm. And I ended up, uh, well, let, so freeze here. <clears throat> After the game, everyone was scheduled to come to my house for this party, for my birthday party, saying goodbye to me after I was going to be moving away. And right before this party, I kicked the losing goal into our own goal. <laughs> <laughs> so then all these kids who were really annoyed at me came to my birthday party and it was oh man hellish it was horrible and then i left town <laughs> and didn't see any of them for like many years uh so that's almost like is that is that almost as sad as his van halen video all he did was get like get some mud on him <laughs> Yeah, you were humiliated on your birthday. <laughs> I humiliated myself on my birthday. That's even worse. Yes. You did it to yourself. Uh, I love yeah. the quote that Bobcat has in his episode about Polly Shore. He said, Polly Shore is not bad. Teenagers need another Ernest. <laughs> I figured you'd like that one. Yeah. And what's great about all the guests, especially like Bobcat and Dennis Miller, is that like Ben Stiller cannot hide that he's very amused by these people. And, and you can tell that these are actually improvised bits like like yeah. like ben stiller yeah. is kind of taken yeah. aback by what some of the people say or there's has that true delay of him thinking about what the person just said and then starting to laugh about it like after he's realized what has just been said out loud by the guest and i really like like that yeah yeah the guests the guest bits are they, they make me a little uncomfortable but some of them make me more uncomfortable than others. But I think they're um, supposed to be uncomfortable, right? It's I know. All, no, like, it's, it's supposed good. to be very yeah. awkward. Like yeah. the one where it's Gary Shandling showing up and he's tricked because he thought it was a lunch, but then he's actually there to be on the show, to be in these bits in between. <laughs> well, let's, we'll get to that one. So, so, uh, so then see, uh, episode three, we have James Doohan shows up. Uh, that's when we first get our legends of Springsteen in the frolic room, which is just so funny if you know LA because... The Frolic Room is the last play. They, there's no music there. And it's it's like a very like a Bukowski hole in the wall <laughs> bar. Uh, so but anyway, it's fun to see it. And then we have Amish Studs, which we talked about. Michael Ferret, agent with Run DMC, Legends of Springsteen with Janine Garofalo, and then one of my favorites, The Quest for Space. <laughs> With uh, I I feel like this has got to be an Odenkirk bit. 
uh, with uh, sort of a, what is it, like a newsreel about John F. Kennedy sending models into space. <laughs> very weird. <laughs> yeah, very weird. <laughs> I love that. And then my favorite... Uh, my favorite of this episode's Springsteen bits where the whole joke is like Springsteen does everything. So he cleans the bar and gives this guy a shave and then he delivers Janine Garofalo's babies and keeps, <laughs> keeps it from being stolen by aliens. <clears throat> but then the Odenkirk bit where he teaches, he helps Abraham Lincoln write <laughs> and he's got the Gettysburg great, address. And he's got that great line the Odenkirk delivers of, well, you're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so we're moving on to episode four, which I guess the guest is Melrose Boulevard. They're just, <laughs> it's them hanging out on Melrose Boulevard and making fun of how hip it is. Um, weird bit, but, uh, and that's sort of, I feel like this is one, the one where Andy's being a madman. They start playing into that more, which kind of makes sense. It took him three episodes to figure out that this guy's insane. And then, in on the Melrose episode, he starts like his in between films bits get crazier. Yeah. Leading to like eventually he's climbing a building and all this stuff. But then in that episode, we get Skank Goes Blind, which is a <laughs> is a great one. Uh Norman Fell, I think is shows up in that one. Yep, yep. <clears throat> and I don't know if you noticed this, but since we've talked about it in earlier episodes. I feel like the music for Skank is inspired by the music for Taxi. <laughs> America's going nuts for Fox's newest comedy smash, Skank. Skank. That kind of mellow sort of soundy yeah. sitcom music. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we get the Doug Shatke, <laughs> Tabitha Soren's uh, uh, bit about the Doug uh, Shatke single from Bob Odenkirk playing Iceman McGee. Cutting on my lawn and scattering his clippings. You think I don't know where my yard begins? He lives in Spring Row, number 311. Suck against home every night around 7. Kill Doug Shatke. That's right, I said kill Doug Shatke. Peace. Mr. Shafke granted us an exclusive interview at his home in Los Angeles. What did I do? I know he has a right to say anything, but I, I'm going to get killed here. I got to move. This is not a good place for me to be right now. You should get out of here, too. <clears throat> a bit which I thought was, which I found funny at the time, but isn't, hasn't aged as well for me, which is the WDVL clip uh a bit where which one where ben stiller plays the the radio dj who's in hell oh what i like about that is that i didn't realize that it is a exact not even a parody it is just a replica of a tales from the dark side episode that starred jerry stiller i was i was watching tales from the dark side last year or maybe the year before and there was this episode that was basically the same thing where jerry stiller is doing this thing he thinks he's uh, you know, and then ends up he's in hell, and it's just a terrible twist ending. And clearly, that was very amusing to his son, and he just replicated it exactly for the show. So that's why I find it amusing because it's just like, oh, that thing my dad did that was really dumb that when I was a teenager I saw him do. I'm just gonna make fun of that on my show <laughs> and not change much of anything. <laughs> that's great. <clears throat> So uh, then we have B-minus Time Traveler with Janine Garofalo. <laughs> Excellent. B-minus Time Traveler. With nothing but a B-minus average from an American public school, she plunges through space and time, helping whomever she can with her vague, sketchy knowledge of American history. Come on, Stacy, shake those cobwebs loose. July 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. September 12th, 1941, a day that will live in... Come on, General MacArthur, they both sound right. How could you forget the day Pearl Harbor was bombed? Well, it's like super easy to cheat in that class because I had this friend, Stacy, we had this system rigged where you would write it on your arm. She was always the one who asked, why do we need to know this stuff? Well, now she has her answer. (laughs) 
Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's that's great. And then we have the introduction of Tito Gallegos, the pig Latin lover, which we've already discussed, which is fantastic. For episode five, we have Colin Quinn. Yeah. And this is when I realized how much of this, like these interstitials they shot up in Runyon Canyon where I go and run all the time. And there was like, oh, yeah, I just started recognizing all of these spots. But that's where we have the first appearance of the Just Do It guy with Casey Kasem. <laughs> And the Melrose Heights 902102402 robot episode, which I don't think I would really like that bit if it had just been the first one. Like the first one I thought was pretty dumb, but the the robot episode where everyone thinks he's a robot <laughs> Very when <good>. he's <laughs> he's clearly hiding having has another secret that <laughs> I just, I just, I don't know. There's something about that that I just find really wonderful. And then Information 411 with Adam West. I'm Adam West. Tonight on Information 411, true stories from the over 5 million people a day who call the nation's directory assistance searching for phone numbers, addresses, and area codes. People who, for whatever reason, can't look it up themselves. I guess Adam West would be another one of those TV stars. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of that era. Yeah. <laughs> Episode six is Sarah Jessica Parker. This is the one that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> and it's supposed to. But he really, he definitely plays a loser who tries to set up, to manipulate her into having a date with him. It doesn't go well. <laughs> but then we have Oliver Stoneland, again, which we discussed. And the uh, arrival of John F. O'Donohue as a seemingly full member of the cast with the Grateful Dead life insurance salesman and the marionette cop. And then one we didn't talk about, which is one of my favorite bits, is the dandruff. Uh, (laughs) Kids won't remember this, but there were a series of commercials in the 70s and 80s for for Head & Shoulders where there's a a guy and he's in a store with his friend and his friend is like, "Uh uh-oh, look who has dandruff. (laughs) I gotta meet her. Down, boy. Well, it's now or never. Attention, shoppers. You're at a romantic dinner at her place. Candlelight, wine, something with a little spinach in it. And for dessert, humble pie. But she sees your dandruff. I don't have dandruff. Fine. Use your regular shampoo. I can't have dandruff. Aisle nine. You mean you use head and shoulders? Yeah. But you don't have dandruff. Right. Neither will she. Head and shoulders. Hi. Because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And it was already pretty goofy but man they took this to the next level i've got to meet her down boy it's now or never i'm going to introduce myself attention shoppers this man wants to make a good impression but he's got dandruff what the only thing she's going to do when she sees you is flake out hey will you quit talking like that like what in that voice will you stop speaking in that stupid funny voice all the time newsflash this is the way hip and clever young people are supposed to talk yeah well it's just stupid all right here she comes. Hi. Hi. He shoots. He scores. Whoops. Looks like somebody noticed your dandruff. Hey, what she noticed is how lame you are. Hi, my name is Bob. Hi. And I'm the amusing young friend who teaches them all about dandruff. I'm really sorry about my friend. What's wrong with him? Well, for one thing, he's obsessed with dandruff. Oh. Are we having fun yet? And for some reason, he keeps speaking in these irritating, funny phrases. I just just hate him so much sometimes. Better beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life here. Do you want to get a cup of coffee or something? Yeah, I'd love to. Great. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Hey, Mr. Wilson. You know why your wife left you? You've got dandruff. Blue and white dandruff shampoo, because we think this is the way really cool people talk. Caution. Use of this product may result in decreased sense of humor. Manufacturer is not responsible for loss of friends. And knowing that Odenkirk and Garofalo are a couple, because that's kind of, this is the only time really where it plays into that because they, they're they meeting and Ben Stiller's the annoying friend. And you can tell they want to go off together. I really believe it. I really believe it. <laughs> and that they want to get away from this guy. Uh, but I love that bit. <clears throat> And then your one of your favorites, Andy Dick Bomb Squad. And yeah. then Ask Manson, the first appearance of Manson. <laughs> and he just appears doing these, like, sort of answering questions, like how to get a stain out. <laughs> I'm not a stain. You're a stain. <laughs> 
so that's great. And then uh, episode seven, Rob Morrow's the guest. It starts off with counting with Bruce Springsteen. Just, I've already played it. Or if I haven't, I'll play it again because it's so good. <laughs> then the Grungies, which yeah. I always really liked. You want to talk yeah. about that one a little bit? Here we come, just trying to compete with all the other bands on the Seattle street. Hey, hey, we're the Grungies. People say we're crazy and rude. We're so close on espresso. We're wired with attitude. We're not trying to be friendly. We just want money and fame. We're the X generation. We just like to complain. Hey, hey, we're the Grungies. We can't stop crunching around. Hope our future is better than the life we're living now. Wow. Yeah, it's a monkey's parody, but them doing basically Seattle, you know, like they all look like, you know, members of Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. <laughs> Doing a very 90s, like, what if there was a 90s grunge version of the Monkees? Which they did. They In real life, they tried to do. There was a new Monkees, I think, in, like, the late 80s, early 90s. It wasn't grunge, but they tried to do an updated one. And it just didn't work. It was terrible. But, like, I totally could see this working as an actual show. Like, the Grungies, I feel, could have been <laughs> a legit show. <laughs> t- it would have been another show that would have only lasted a season. But I wouldn't have held it against Hollywood to actually attempt to do something like this. Yeah, so the Grungies, then we have Stiller's Wheel of Filler, which this is kind of where I start to think they are getting an idea that this show is going to fail. I feel like Steel's <laughs> Wheel of Filler was the one. And then we also Grady's Oats. So yeah. Dana Gould shows up. Even before when John F. O'Donohue starts becoming a major cast member, there's this sense of like, well, we're not going to get, let's let John, you know. Yeah, like, like fuck it. <laughs> Let's go. If you're going to add a fifth ca- cast member out of this, out of all these people that are around you, don't you think it would? If you, if you're trying to make a successful show, don't you think <laughs> it would have been old... David Cross or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So anyways, uh, then but we have Grady's Oats, which is just awesome, and of buildings and women from Odenkirk, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'll probably I'll either have already played a clip or play a clip now. <laughs> Women, buildings, sometimes they are the same thing. I am never alone. Wherever I go in the city, I am surrounded by buildings. And wherever I see buildings, there I see my women. (laughs) Ah, the museum. The museum reminds me of Cheryl. Cheryl loves the paintings of sad clowns. The kind the child could do. <laughs> it's funny. She was a masterpiece herself. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, the observatory. So many evenings Janet and I would walk along its deck until one night I played a little joke on her and pushed her over the edge. I am the devil himself. <laughs> The post office. I can't help thinking of Vivian. For she too had a line of customers packed up into the street. And she works there. Hello, Vivian. Hello. Laurie. Susan. Yes, Claire. Ah, yes. This apartment building, it reminds me of Frank. I was so drunk that night. Hello, Frank. I am not ashamed. <laughs> Such is life, huh? Yes. The mall. So many shops. So many women I am reminded of. Quickly, get me away before my brain explodes. I must leave the city. Oh, no. Every tree reminds me of a woman. Then episode eight, Flea shows up to best Ben Stiller at basketball. Mm-hmm. And we get some great bits. Just this might be one of the best ones. We got the last of the Mohicans and the Mohican <laughs> Master 2000. Uh, we have Die Hard 12, Tony Bobbins, yeah. Manson, 
the yeah. Lassie Manson and the do it guy with Hervé Villachez yeah. and a skank Very. episode that features several eighties porn stars <laughs> and then more Tony Bobbins. And now a special message about the let go clinic with Tony Bobbins. Hi, my name is David Cassidy and I'm about to tell you something that could change your life. Two years ago, my girlfriend dumped me despite the fact that I'm a huge star and still look incredibly young and handsome. Anyway, the point is, I was so shattered emotionally, I could hardly carry on with my life. A life of ease and riches. Then I met Tony Bobbins. You know, when a girl breaks up with you, it's like you're an insect or something. You're a fly and she's ripped off your wings. What we do at the Let Go Clinic is give you the tools you'll need to grow those wings back. Teach you to fly again. So you can buzz around and find her and burn her face with your noxious saliva. That's what the Let Go Clinic is all about. Tony, what exactly do the esteemed coaches at your center do? Good question. You know, after my fifth wife left me, I was living in an 8 by 10 foot studio apartment, 300 pounds overweight, chained to the wall, eating dog food. Now, I'm over 7 feet tall, so that doesn't paint a pretty picture. I mean, I'd really hit bottom. Then I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could pay someone to fix my life for me? So that's what I've done. Really? Yeah, that's a very. Think, that's one yeah. of the best ones. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna do just one episode. I think maybe episode one. It's episode eight and nine, because yeah. episode nine we got Gary Shandling. Yeah, it starts off with Springsteen cutting Gary Coleman's hair. Awesome! <laughs> I love that so much. He's like, "Can I keep it?" <laughs> no, Coleman's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he does it anyway. Uh, then we get Woody Allen's Frankenstein. Fantastic. Oh. Club Frederick working it out two three four, <laughs> which is it gets really dark and I uh, love it. That that bit feels so much like a Tim and Eric skit to me. Like like when you have this weird looking old man, it's really dark and strange. Like that that skit feels very modern to me. Like it feels like an Adult Swim thing. Yeah yeah. Then we get some more Michael Ferret, uh, another John O'Donohue cop story. Your favorite, the frat boys at the Natural History Museum <laughs> for bad twist ending yeah. theater. And then we close out with Foxy Fox with Judd, Ap Judd Apatow. Also a great episode. And also another one that's the, the part that I found uncomfortable was when the rest of the cast are sort of mocking Gary Shandling at the table. <laughs> and like particularly Andy, like he's talking about him to Ben and just maybe it's just. <laughs> PTSD from hanging out with Andy so much, but I kind of believe that he really was making Gary Shandling annoyed. Hey, welcome back, and we're really excited because Gary Shandling is here, and I hope you don't mind, Gary, but I invited the entire cast to see you because this is a big thing for us to actually meet someone of your nice stature. Yeah, and... celebrity. I know, it's really, it's really wild. I love it. Pretty great. <laughs> how, many, how many times do you think he was on The Tonight Show? Hundreds. I've Hundreds. never met anyone who was Hundreds. on Make Me Laugh before. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I remember that. He probably makes millions. Okay. You know? Yeah. Gary's right so, here, I mean, guys. millions. Guys, you could, you could just... Director strong, so dude. Tall. You can tell he's strong. He's I, yeah, yeah, it looks like he in, works in, out internally and probably, externally. He's got to work out and drink like carrot juice or something. Okay, okay, stuff. guys. So, Gary, do you have anything you want to say? The Larry Sanders Show on HBO. Check your local listings. Who's using who, buddy boy? What was that supposed to mean? I don't know, mean? but the I... voice was still beautiful. <laughs> right. He is beautiful. brilliant. Why don't, why, why don't we just go to uh, another film? That has yet to be determined. Gary, it was like no. <laughs> um, so episode ten, uh, which is the Dennis Miller episode, and this is where they talk about the show being canceled. So again, I'm feeling like this is <laughs> this is getting there. Uh, <clears throat> we have three men and an, and an old man. <laughs> so good. That is such a, like the parody of the three men and the babies movies down to just like they're dumb dancing around like the kitchen mm -hmm. and just like all these moments that you'd see in a stupid trailer. Just so spot on. So good. Them singing uh, to the old man as he's dying. In the yeah. bed. It's like so weird. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um, more Manson. This might actually be the one, the, the Manson with Lassie episode is in episode 10. Then we have the Beethoven auditions with uh, Ben Stiller's Pacino. <laughs> 
And uh, Andy Dick, Sandra Bernhard, which is great. Or that she's yeah. doing Mighty Ducks. She's doing the Mighty but, Ducks. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's really good. Her just wanting to lick lick yeah. Jenny Garofalo's face, and it's like the, it's a very good Sandra Bernhard. America's most suspicious, which is <laughs> these people, uh, these very nosy neighbors, calling the cops on Andy Dick for acting weird, and the Pig Latin Lover special, yeah. uh, which. They, I feel like they're spending their budget at the end. They're like, okay, <laughs> yeah. Have, yeah, can we? They, they're having fun. I that that and one. A, and again, worked. another skit that just keeps going. It's like they're really committed to giving yeah. you like a full taste of what that show would be like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, episode eleven, we have the skank scandal, and that also felt very Mister Show, like the way that we have one bit spilling into another bit and just sort of sort of randomly jumping in f- from world to world. Mm-hmm. And then that's also the next uh, episode is the one where David Cross shows up with Metallica in that episode. Yeah. Andy Dick's children's political theater, which feels very <laughs> Dino Stamatopoulos. I, this is by, ep- there's also a feeling I have by episode 11 that they're letting the reins go on the writers, letting some of the people who like using some of the bits that didn't get approved for earlier episodes. Yeah, they're like, like who Andy cares Dick's now? <laughs> children's political theater feels like it. Uh, we have another Stiller's wheel of filler with Springsteen making an answering machine tape. That's great. The relaxation tape number six <laughs> yeah. stuff is, is great. Again, jump in if there's any, if there's any that you feel like oh, we need to talk about. But then in episode 12, the penultimate episode, we get a, a, a few good scouts, which is, <laughs> I, I think it's okay. I, they, it, what's funny is that they wouldn't let any of the other cast members play Jack Nicholson. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a bit, but they, they literally didn't let any of the other actors play Nicholson. And I feel like that's kind of a, I would have rather seen anyone else play Nicholson than whoever they got. I mean, no offense <laughs> to that guy, but. It would have been more fun to watch John F. O'Donohue do a Nicholson yeah, yeah. or <laughs> even Andy. Di- like any. Like, uh, come on. Odenkirk can't do a Nicholson. He's got the hair. He doesn't need to do pull the hair back. <laughs> um, then we have medieval cops, uh, American profiles, Billy Bob Hoyt, high tech hillbilly, which also feels like a Mr. Show bit. Yeah. Some more Grady's Oats. And the legend of T.J. O'Pooter Toots, which, which feels very Mister Show. To yeah, me. yes, that, that feels like it's weird. Like when I think of that skit, I forget which show it's on. Like in my mind, sometimes that show, like that skit, is like, oh no, that's on a Mister Show, right? And it's like, no, that was on the Ben Stiller show. Like that skit, like I wish that was the last skit on the show because that feels like the true transition from Ben Stiller show to Mister Show. Yep, and Dino Stamatopoulos shows up as one of the mustachioed. Um, uh, well, I don't want to give away the bit, but uh, one of the employees of the TJ Pooter Toots. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but it wasn't the last episode. The last episode is the Zoo TV episode. So we bring back you two, and the bits aren't really much. I feel like they've they've used up everything they've got. So they bring in Dana Gould to play Otto, the anti-Cupid. Yeah. The anti-Cupid. They have the creepy board game, which feels <laughs> like another Dino bit. Michael Ferret with Howie Mandel, the 32nd conspiracy theory and Jacques Cousteau, which is <laughs> actually pretty great. Andy the Jacques Dick Cousteau, as... Andy Dick is Jacques Cousteau. That's a good one. <laughs> That's the manatee. Is a slow lumbering dossier creature, swimming majestically in the filthy toilet that man has created. We blow chunks into their home, rape their environment. We are committing genocide. Cut. I'm so sorry. He's a little fatigued from the expedition, or perhaps a little punch drunk. All right, Jacques, time is money, okay? So let's just do this again. Oh, money? How much dollars will it take to clean the ocean? Let's do it again. Recuing. Monsieur Lamont, please read the script in your hands. Pierre, this is my 85th special. 
I know what I'm doing. <laughs> He'll be fine. He better be. The Manati is a slow, lumbering, docile creature that runs the depths of the sea, searching in vain for a sweet lover. Oh, I need a woman. Kiss me. Kiss me. Cut. I love you. Why do you taunt me with your beauty? Hey, get off the glass! Oh, your loins scream for me, admit it. Disgusting. Come on, guys! Maybe that's the transition to the Andy Dick show. <laughs> and then we have this big Zoo TV concert with... with Sherman Hemsley. <laughs> <laughs> with you two doing Moving On Up with Sherman Hemsley <laughs> and Wheezy on the, on the video monitor. Wheezy! Yeah, well, anyway, she's giving me one of her looks. No. Ooh, I know what you're talking about. It's that stone-cold look when you come home late from the dry cleaners once again. Right. And Marla, Florence, Ooh. tells me, I'm not wiping it up, Mr. Jefferson. Now, she is a sassy lass, isn't she? Oh, yeah. She can really cook up the bacon and fry it up in a pan, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I bend down to clean it up, but I slip and fall face first into it, right? I get mm. up, it's all over my face, I'm bleeding, but I never miss a beat. The crowd goes crazy, and the cameras never stop rolling. This man is a trooper, isn't he? Let's give it up to Sherman Hemsley. Now, Sherman, I also understand that you're writing a cookbook. Is that so? That's right. Now, why a cookbook for Sherman Hemsley, huh? Well, because I love that down-home Louisiana spicy cooking. Ooh, I love the way you say that. Wait a minute. Louisiana. <laughs> say it. Say it. Louisiana. I love it. Louisiana. Yeah. Louisiana. <laughs> Oh, hey, 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 check this out. Isn't this incredible? The man is Sherman Hensley. The book is cooking with Sherman Hensley. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let me say we take a look at what's on Zoo TV today. Hey, why not? All right, here we go. Kazin says, but in a game of doubles. Judge Jefferson, what are you up to now? Ladies and gentlemen, Zoo TV satellite from Cairo, Egypt. It's Isabel Wheezy Sanford. <laughs> Isabel, you look as beautiful as ever. And Sherman, it's nice to see you as cute and tiny as ever. <laughs> of course, I'm watching you on a tiny little monitor. Ah, the magic is still there, people. Isn't it beautiful? You're seeing a magical reunion. And that's what it's all about, people coming together, moving together. Because then if we can move together, we can move it on up. Isn't that right, Sherman? That's right. Isn't that right, Wheezy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're moving on up, moving on up to the east side. Moving on up to a dealer's apartment in the sky. Moving on up, moving on up to the east side. Moving on up, we finally got a piece of the pie. See it easy. Fish don't fry in the kitchen. Beans don't burn on the grill. Took a whole lot of trying just to get up that hill. Now we're up in the big league, get my turn and back. As long as we live, you and me, baby, ain't nothing wrong with that. Well, we're moving on up, moving on up to the east side. Moving on up, we finally got a piece of the pie. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to thank my guests, Mr. Sherman George Jefferson Hensley, Miss yeah. Isabel Weezy Sandberg. For the edge, Adam Clayton and Larry Mullen Jr. My name is Bono. Remember, I'm not a god. I just play one on television. We'll see you tomorrow night on 2TV late at night. Thank you. It's yeah. awesome. Actually, I do love that end episode because it's just so blown <laughs> out. And you end up with that is, yeah, it's pretty yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It's pretty fantastic. <laughs> It's you can watch the show in a day. It goes by so quick. Like the episodes are like twenty minutes long. It just flies by. The show. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Uh, and I really appreciate that there's no laugh track unless it's a like parody of a laugh track. Like I like because mm-hmm. it just I did that'll kill shows, especially like in the in in between bits. Like just the idea if there was like forced or canned laughter doing that, it just would have like. It just doesn't work for this kind of humor. Like, you, like, where would you put the laugh track in these skits? Because it's like a lot of it is more just the idea is funny or it's weird. And so I'm so glad that there's no 
laughing. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I can't imagine that. I'm, I'm sure someone must have given him the note. What about yeah. a laugh track? And yeah. I'm glad they said only if it's after that line. <laughs> we'll give you a laugh track every time you ask for a laugh track. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a great show. The Ben Stiller yeah. show. This show was okay. This this podcast has been fine, but that that was a great show. We hope that we can launch some of our cast members into the stratosphere like that show did. <laughs> and uh, just just as a little digression for a second, like there's a weird like this was a weird time when Fox was constantly trying to make a sketch comedy show work, and it they kept failing. They kept getting shows that would only last as long as this. It would be like if they were lucky 12 episodes. And I think I wonder if it's because like at the time SNL was really popular. Like you were getting into like Wayne's world and like things that like people like, they, like young people were into SNL in the early nineties. And I wonder if they were trying to find something to kind of like fit in with it. And they had do you remember there was a, there was a show called the edge. Do you remember the edge? No. I don't know if that was before or after this, but that was the Julie Brown sketch comedy show. Uh, and at the end, beginning of every episode, they die. And then the supporting players were very weird. Wayne Knight. That was the first time I ever saw Wayne Knight. He was on it as just one of the sketch people. Uh, David Herman. Uh, totally great. I watched every episode. I was obsessed with sketch comedy shows as a kid. And so I just, any of it I'd watch. There was John Leguizamo's House of Buggin'. <clears throat> Uh, and these all were around the same time of like, it would be like within that hour before The Simpsons, where they were sort of like... Okay, we got the cool Gen X people watching The Simpsons. So what else can we kind of put around that that would work for them? And House of Buggin was great. And uh, Louise Guzman is one of the supporting players on that show. So seeing Louise Guzman do comedy skits (laughs) is fantastic. (laughs) Um, This was around, I think this was right before or right, like The State was soon after this. Mm -hmm. And that was on MTV. And that was kind of the same they felt kind of like like a branch off of this in a way, like even though those people had been doing live stuff together while the show was on and before Ben Stiller show, but that was more of that sort of like Gen X counterculture, like very self-aware sketch comedy uh, and another show that launched a million great careers. Um, And then you had the Dana Carvey show, which I love. Did you watch that when that was on TV? No, oh, no, I didn't. I oh, can't say I, I, did. I, I was, I, did. I was, in, I was in it to win it from the beginning, and it was so good. <laughs> and that show is amazing. And there's that great documentary about it. Uh, and like that show is on DVD, so it did last somehow to be a, wait. And like that's another show that's just like so smart and so much talent. But like this is Steve Carell and Stephen Colbert before anyone knew who they were. You now Robert Schmeigel, and that show just has. Also, like that, that's a show where they just are just like, we're going to do whatever fucking weird shit we want. And we're just going to go crazy with <laughs> like, if you like the church lady in Wayne's world, this is not the Dana Carvey you're going to like. This is a very weird Dana Carvey. And, uh, and then eventually Fox figures it out with mad TV in the late nineties. And that actually stayed on the air for many years. And that like, that was the one that worked for whatever reason that one clicked um even you know, though what's, what, could, yeah, let's let's talk about that because i mean when you say they figured it out i don't feel like i mean i haven't seen all of these other ones but compared to mr show and the ben stiller show and the state and even the andy dick show i, I think mad tv is a little <laughs> bit <laughs> Maybe it's it's too, it's too clip. Maybe it's maybe figuring it out means doing it more like Saturday Night Live. Yeah, maybe. no, that's what it was. It just became more broad and more simple. And the I mean, I like Mad TV, but the skits oh, yeah. were basically it's very yeah. much like SNL, where it's like the skits are not are going to be based around these characters with these catchphrases, and we're going to have these characters come back and come back and do this sort of like. And it was more like SNL, where you'd had they had like a host or a music guest. Like that was the first time I ever saw, um, like Jack Black play music was on Mad TV, um, and they it just that for whatever reason that was a show that worked. I think maybe the timing was right too. I think that 
show came on when SNL was starting to really bottom out <laughs> in the mid late nineties. So mm-hmm. I think like they wanted, and it was on Saturday night at the same time, or like maybe a half hour before. So that one actually clicked with people uh, that these other sketch shows didn't quite work. But I think you're right. It isn't, it doesn't have that edginess <laughs> that any of these other better shows have. It definitely is more, like just another version of Saturday Night Live. Like maybe like the dirtier, it was like the dirtier Saturday Night Live was sort of how Mad TV felt. What Where does In Living Color fit into all of this? That, that's, I want to say that started in the late 80s. Like in my mind, like In Living Color, like was maybe 89, maybe 90. Um, But that, I mean, that's definitely, that show worked too. Like, yeah, I totally forgot about it. In Living Color, that was 90. It started in 90. And so maybe they were trying with all these shows to find something else like In Living Color. Because that show was very popular. It was on for years. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have Jim Carrey coming off that show. Like, you have a lot of big people. There was also, like, the Wayans family kind of going off of the success of I'm Gonna Get You Sucker and working on, like, as a stand-up comedian and doing, like, their own show. And that show's definitely edgy and pushing buttons and very not like Saturday Night Live because it's just like so like they really go for it on that show they are fearless <laughs> in leaving color some sometimes very offensively so but uh yeah so maybe that's what they were hoping with all these other Ben Stiller shows and things is like can we get another in living color that can be on for like 6 years and launch some careers and be our SNL well at least they tried they yeah. tried <laughs> I, they, maybe I'm just obsessed with Skank, but I feel like we don't get Greg the Bunny, or at least Greg the Bunny is. It's another yeah. show that was only had only one season and was fantastic and was too smart. But I always feel like there's something, something in the DNA of Greg the Bunny goes back to Skank, which I guess means that we also have to. Uh, blame them both for what's the what's the mark. Wahlberg movie with the with oh the, Ted, Ted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess we have to blame them for Ted because yeah. Ted feels dirty like, puppet, you know, like the Mad puppet. TV version. Like it's like they figured out how to do this brilliant thing in a way that isn't as brilliant, so that people would love it. And then there's so. that cop tales with the marionettes. It feels very much like Team America. Hmm. Um, You're right. You're yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, you know that all these people saw this stuff, and in a yeah. way, I'm not. I'm not saying it's even stealing. It's not stealing to like look at something that was like, okay, these guys did this one thing. I love it. The show got canceled. Let's do our version of that. Yeah, and do it better. That's not stealing. That's just uh, that's just the folk processes. What he got what he used <laughs> to call it when he was busy stealing other people's songs. Uh, <clears throat> not. I'm not taking a swipe at Woody Guthrie here. It really was. He called it the folk process. You do your version of somebody else's song and you call it your own. (laughs) Arlo Guthrie used to do great bits about it at his shows. Anyway, um, (laughs) uh, I wanted to just go back to something you were talking about earlier when you were talking about Fox signing up all of these comedy shows and, you know, what might have been the the reasoning for it. And I've always kind of thought about, like, with The Simpsons, like... It's weird that The Simpsons were on Fox. It was always this weird sort of cognitive dissonance, like at the very time that Fox News was sort of destroying news in a lot of ways. uh, They were giving us the best comedy out of, especially particularly, you know, being from Olympia, The Simpsons felt real like a hometown thing because Matt Groening went to Evergreen. And it just was so weird that that's where it found a home. And I don't know, there was just something I was thinking about when I was thinking about, well, if you were going to be launching this right wing movement, you'd want to get the jokesters and the comedians on your side. I don't know. Like there's something <laughs> like yeah. you you like if they're parodying like they're parodying you, but you're still advertising you you're still canceling them or funding them, like Judd Apatow can run around saying Foxy Fox all he wants <laughs> and makes you look cool for ha- for being associated with them. Yeah, it it definitely is really weird. It is just like there was a, it's just always that weird separation of like in the 90s, you had Fox, the channel that felt very counterculture in a way and really trying to be like 
different and like definitely kind of left in a way, especially with the Simpsons, you know, uh, and then you have the rise of Fox News in the 90s, which is not that. And then you also have Fox, the company that, you know, 20th Century Fox that makes the movies. And it didn't seem like any of them have the same. <laughs> it's like they don't have the same staff meetings or whatever. Like it reminds me of when I used to work at a Kinko's back when it was called Kinko's. And you'd have like the North Kinko's and the South Kinko's of Olympia. And yes, it was the same company, but man, were those places run very differently. <laughs> And it's just very strange. But yeah, or maybe it was this sort of thing of like, let's just see if we can get them on our side. Didn't work. Uh, <laughs> but I guess they, maybe they got Dennis Miller on their side a bit. But uh, well, you know, it, it, it's, you know, after we've just we've just loved on this show so much, there is. When I watch it, there is something I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about my criticisms of Ready Player One in the last episode and if you're you don't have to look that hard to see that there's something sort of there's a mean white stripe through this through this show <laughs> and yeah. it's hard for me to say cuz i really i i love it but you know just like they are mocking the bad cop when in the in the John F O Donahue segments but they're yeah. also like in that uh in the puppets thing, there's racial stereotypes in the in the puppetry, and I kind of want. There's a part of me that after I kind of dug in pretty hard against Ready Player One last week, and I was <laughs> sitting back and listening to that episode and thinking, I should apply some of that criticism to a popular show that was on Fox. It was canceled from Fox, so obviously they didn't yeah. do their job of propping that up. So that in a way, that's that's a success. But I don't know. There's just something. I think someone could potentially watch the Ben Stiller show now if they weren't, you know, longtime friends with Andy Dick and were and sort of were in that world or just like yourself, like a a white guy who's into comedy and people might see it differently. And you were trying to bring this up earlier in the episode when it came to Janine Garofalo. And, uh, you know, I couldn't see it because I had my my Ben Stiller blinders <laughs> on. Uh <laughs> Particularly Bob Odenkirk, yeah. though I feel like Bob is can be his stuff can be particularly mean, in <laughs> and if you think of it in terms of Dennis Miller and Fox, like playing a little bit to that audience, in a way yeah. that I don't know, uh, especially too like we were talking about in Living Color, like that was actually a very diverse cast on that show, even though that is considered sort of a Wayans project and people kind of group it in with like black humor and black comedy on tv but like you have jim carrey out of that show you there was uh you know there, there was a few asian actors on there like they were was a fairly diverse uh group and that shows from 90 that was a year before this so like this this show could have actually taken a little bit from that and maybe made it open up a bit here's the thing i <laughs> wouldn't change people. that's the thing is i wouldn't change this any bit it's not like they, i'm saying oh we should tack on a of another famous black comedian to this to make because that's the Ben Stiller show show is that's what it is and yeah. I don't think it's aggressively you know stupidly white I mean to me yeah it, it it's not married with children I you know I don't know if people love that or but there's a way there's a kind of humor that that traffics in that this is in a totally other place so yeah. I, I'm not sure I'd want to change the Ben Stiller show because I think it's perfect and yeah just thinking about Fox and comedy in the nineties and yeah. it made me, you know, just look at this a little bit more closely and see, okay, well there's ways that mm. I could be the world that's wrong about this. And yeah. it's worth uh, ending this love fest with just a question, you know, with the question mark of, Hmm, why do we love it so much? <laughs> Andras here. When I'm not co-hosting the World is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen. 
and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. Hi, everybody. Sorry to interrupt this show that you're probably enjoying, but I'm comedian Kevin Dombrowski, who you probably don't know. Joined weekly by my producer, Adam, a little bit more well-known than me, Hineker. Say hi, Adam. True. He's got a point. Uh, Dial it back. Each episode, I'll sit down with a very famous comedian that you probably do know. And if they're not famous, you probably know them anyway. And we'll break down what's happening in the world by making fun of all of it. This is Just Joking on the Paper House Network. No interviews, no arguments, just jokes. Now, back to your show that you were already enjoying. Dear listener, If you are just discovering our podcast, you can find all of our episodes on our website at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can also write to us at contact at theworldiswrongpodcast.com or follow us on Instagram at theworldiswrongpodcast. And now, back to the show. Eight notes scale and octave. Well, that's that's the that's Master, the Ben Stiller show, and if, isn't it great? We got we got we're, we got all this this generational stuff. We got Dweezil and Frank Zappa, Arlo <laughs> and Woody Guthrie, Ben and Jerry Stiller with and Mira. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I could tell you a story about Andy Dick's dad. <laughs> Does he want you to tell the story about his dad? <laughs> well, once when so Andy's been on Radio Eight Ball many times. And the thing about uh, having Andy on is like when he was so when he called in and he was sober, he was the best guest in the world. When he called in and he was drunk, he was the worst guest in the world. And for many years, uh, when Dino wasn't as busy as he is these days, <clears throat> I would always ask Dino to be Andy's second. So if Andy didn't show up or showed up in an impossible state, I could just be like, OK, well, I'm going to go to Dino now. Um <laughs> And at this one, he called in. It was a live show on stage. He called in rip roaring drunk. And he was there with his birth father. Andy Dick was adopted. He's talked about it a lot. This is not giving anything away. And he was just mercilessly tearing, like te- yelling at this old man. <laughs> Yikes. Like, it's very uncomfortable for the whole audience. Uh, yeah. But uh, and now I've brought some of that discomfort to our audience. So. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, uh, that was uh, you, you can clap for that if you, you're inspired. So that was a clip from the Andy Dick show, and the guy who was yelling what? on the phone, I think, was Andy's assistant. Yeah, it was wonderful it, to talk to you too. Not it, it bodes ill for for this next I segment, can. but I, uh, I uh, but uh, are we ready to introduce the celebrity Skype of the show? Well, the our, thank our you friend very Andy much. Dick? Well, Responding me, I guess. I'm I'm more frustrated. Okay, now I hear him. What? <laughs> wow, we're how y'all doing? Are you okay, Andras? Yes. Are you on? Are you here, Andy? Can you see me? <laughs> no, we can't see you yet. You can hear me. Yes. So yes. we're just gonna do it with sound. We have no video. So uh, no camera, no camera. Okay. I'm on the phone, Andras. I, I, you know, I hate to. Get me. Can you get? No hand. I am on the phone with my biological father, who I never never answer the phone to because he's a fucking asshole. Hey, say hi to Andras, Dad. Hello? Hi, Dad. Um, but, Andy, is this, is, is this a lead-in to your question for the Pop Oracle? No, I'm in uh, West Virginia. You know that. Yeah, I know that. So what? What is your? What's your question? We'd love to be able to see you, but hang on a minute, Andras. Let, 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 I want my dad. To, I want my quote-unquote dad. 
to ask the question. Hey, let him ask, ask a question, Daddy. Yeah. This is how you should. And ask a question. Are you mad at me? Oh, there's the question. Okay. Are you mad at me? Okay. Yeah. Well, is, is Andy, so I think that I think that's a question only I can answer, but I'll let you answer it with your goddamn indie band that I'm hearing book. <laughs> okay. Well, well, Andy, I am now going to spin the wheel of eight and answer your question. Are you mad at me? Answer is as the crow flies. Listen close. As the what? As the crow flies. It, the song's called As the Crow Flies. It's right up your goddamn alley, you redneck fucking. <laughs> as the crow flies. A Andy. the 
crow flies. The answer to Andy Dick's biological father's question. Are hey. you mad at me? Are you mad at me? Hello. And, hey. And before we go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Before we go to you, Andy. Hold on just one second. Levi. Can Wait, you hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Could you hear me during the song? No, not at all. We turned you down and we'll do it again for just a second. Uh, so Thank that we God. can hear what Levi just, Fuller has I, to say I was, I was just about that song, and then out. we'll bring you on. Levi, tell us a little bit about where that song comes from. Oh, well, that's a pretty... Uh, it's from an album of, that I wrote with all Crow-themed songs, but that's actually more of a uh, human-oriented song. It's just kind of a simple sort of love-type sentiment. So I would say my personal interpretation would be no. Yeah. You know, if, if you take that as a yes or no question and that's right. the answer, I would say no. Okay, so well, let's bring Angie Just on. based on the song. I have a couple can you of hear ideas. me? Yes, we can. Andras. Yes, we can. So, okay. Andy. So, is he saying that it's a simple song like I'm a simpleton, like I'm retarded? No. No, I don't think that's what he's saying. It's, it's a uh, love song. It's a, it's sure. just... Is it simple like... I don't... What, what's going on, Andras? Let me... Well, I can help you out. I can help you out here. Because you know what? The, it, actually, this made me think of that song, the Daphne Aguilera song we wrote together, where you have yes. that line about... Uh, I, what about the... I caw, caw, caw. Boys, 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 they like what they see. Toys, 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 and that's what they're to me. No, that's not the same one. Different song. I was thinking of the the one with the caw, where you do where you imitate a bird with a caw 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 like I fly high in the sky with a did we did you even caw, reference caw, it? Caw, caw. Yeah, that's, I know that's good. That's the one. Well, but it made me think how Daphne Aguilera is a character who you've talked about who does have some daddy issues, and so it made me think you know that uh, I did that live on stage tonight by the way, and by the way. I don't know if you've uh, been turning on your TV, but I went to jail. Really? I don't like jail. <laughs> he, you Four, could have fooled us. 14 hours, buddy. 14 hours. I'd like to see you get goddamn. I said, I, I was singing the, it's, it's, it's Huntington, West Virginia. I, I said, it's, it, I thought it was Mayberry. I'm like, this is like Mayberry. And I'm the Otis. <laughs> you are I the Otis. Stuff up. When I left, when I left. You're also a little bit like. When, when I left, I said, leave a light on for me. <laughs> <laughs> when you left, what? The jail. Oh. I think it's when you. Because they're, they're, they're saving a room for you in, West, in a county jail in West Virginia. And buddy, listen. Wait, what? Boys, 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 I don't like what this. Is. I'm up to my hole in boys. Let me tell you that. And that's. Are, is, are those, is that a consensual situation or a non consensual situation? It's always consensual, but they sure would not admit to that. Are you kidding me? Oh, I see what happened. They will be, they will was, be lynched. They was, will be. They, they will be lynched if they consented if, to that. If they admitted to liking being having their crotch grabbed by Andy. They Dick. loved it. No, no. They loved kissing me. We were kissing. I, I don't doubt it. I've seen the pictures. Um, There's, there are no pictures. You, so I just want to... Andy, I just, you, can't, you can't... Andy, you can't, see the, you can't see the audience right now, but there is a look of such terror... <laughs> On the eyes of all these people, uh, they don't—they don't really know what to make of it. They don't know you the way I do, and know that this is well, this is let just. Me, let, can I tell them something? Anything you want, Andy. Andras Jones, the star, the star of Nightmare on Elm Street Part Five, Four. Part Un Du Trois Quatre Cinq, Four. Part Cinq. Sure. He he is the star. He was in a movie with Drew Barrymore called Far From Home and he let me sleep on his futon in the dining room. I, I made it my own bedroom. I put up a partition that I called the masturbation station. <laughs> and Andras was gracious enough and I will never let him go. And wh where did you live? Where, where did Tell, 
Oh, yeah, I lived in uh, Andy Dick's uh, Airstream trailer outside of his house for two years as his way of you know, paying me back for that. And it was beautiful. It's like, that's exactly where you want to live when you're living at Andy Dick's place, which is outside. It's, it's a 19, it was a 1955 Airstream trailer, silver bullet. You know what they look like. But, 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 but bringing it full circle, now, now who lives in it? You do. Yes, I do. Andy's living in his own trailer. Yes, I do, boy. At least until, at least until they, the West Virginia authorities have their way with you. Um, but we hope that doesn't happen. We hope that you, you skate out of this as you have so many uh, sticky situations in the past. Like a cat with nine lies. How many are you up to now, Andy? 9,000. Yeah, well, that's good. Uh, I've got nine cats. Breaking the laws of physics. Since Buddy, call me tomorrow. I gotta go. You're, I love you. You're, so, you're just as handsome as you were when you were fuckable. <laughs> Can we sample that? That is a quote we're gonna use. So, Brian, I, uh, I think I need to, uh, I need to apologize. I'm yeah. a little distracted. I've been a little bit distracted during this episode. Okay. <laughs> Right before, so I haven't had blood work done in a long time. I, I have a doctor for the first time in a, in a yeah. long time. So I got blood work. And right before we recorded this, I was on the on the phone with them. And they uh, they were looking through all, like, <clears throat> I'm very healthy. All these things. like, oh, this is great. This is great. You're fantastic. And he's like, oh. Like, wow, you have, your B12 is lower than anyone I've ever seen. <laughs> and... He said that 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 might lead to uh, cognitive difficulties. Now, I am, as an actor, I'm highly susceptible to suggestion. And I feel like ever since he said that, I just feel like I can't think well. <laughs> so if I seem like I was having cognitive difficulties... I didn't, this, I didn't pick it, up on that. It uh... might have been just a placebo. It might be... We're getting it taken care of. Well, what so you, food do you need to eat to get vitamin B12? What, uh, what, what is that? What has that? He was saying that it's, that it's unlikely that it's a diet thing. Because oh. he's like, unless you're a full-on vegan, which <clears throat> I'm not. I, I, I have been at times, but, uh, but I'm not currently, with a great deal of shame. But still, that's not the reason. Um, he's just going to get me some B12, and we'll, we'll, he's, maybe uh, it's possible in 2022... I will be a lot smarter than I was in 2021. <laughs> I figured that's what was going on. <laughs> it's like, man, he must be low in vitamin B. He's just not as smart as he once was. What happened? Now we yeah. have an now I have an answer. Now I have proof. Good. Now now um, we know. So I, I apologize. But, but hey, we I'm excited about this show in 2022. This isn't the end of the season for us. This is just the end of the year for everybody. Not for, everybody, only the but, Gregor, only the people who follow the Gregorian calendar. Yeah, it's you know it's a different year in China and yeah, all over the place. Uh, but for us here in America, it's the end of the year. And for you, uh, not for me. <laughs> hey, if you want to show up to work on time, you got to follow the same calendar as everybody else. My year ends on the solstice. So, all right. so you've already it, celebrated New Year. You're done. That's uh, part of why I'm, maybe that's why I'm depleted in my B12. Party too hard. Partied way a too week, hard. A few weeks ago. Um, yes. Anyways, but I think this is a good time for reflection for a moment. Uh, we're not quite halfway through season two. I think we're maybe a little over a third of the way. Does that seem right? Seems about right to me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm excited going into next year. We got. So why don't you tell the people what the next episode is, and then we can kind of go from there. Well, it's pretty exciting. So you yeah. know, we did that episode about Frank, and we loved that episode. That was the first episode of the of this season. And then we did an episode about Okja. You weren't very involved in that episode. We actually had <laughs> like the the fabulous Jen Brown as a guest host on that. And both of those films were written by one John Ronson. And he reached out after the yeah. Frank episode and said, hey, great episode. I really like that. And he's a very, very successful podcaster and journalist and screenwriter in his own right. So we were pretty excited. And I, I wrote back to him and said, hey, would you ever be interested in coming on the show and talking about these films and or a film that you think the world is wrong about? And he said yes to all of them. 
Yeah. (laughs) With a British accent. And (laughs) so we recorded that episode and that is going to be our first episode of the new Gregorian year of 2022. (laughs) And we will be talking about Frank and about Okja and about a film that he suggested that I check out, which is really great. And maybe you should watch it before we get to uh, that episode next week. A film called Pride from the same year that Frank came out. And a uh, really fantastic film. Really, really great film. And it's a and... great episode. It's really, really good. He is a very interesting man. It's really fun. It's really thought-provoking. Like it's, I think it's one of the best episodes we've, we have. Wow. I didn't know you felt that way. Right? I mean, <laughs> he's a great feel, guest. He's a really he's good a great guest. guest. But you were missed. I it, I would never I would never say that an episode that didn't feature you <laughs> was the best we've done. It might be the best we've done without you. But uh, yeah. you bring a lot to the party, and uh, so. But you, but not when I when, but you don't, you don't like to party in groups. You just like to party with me, and maybe <laughs> Bethany Watson. Uh, and uh, and AJ Gonzalez, but it's a small circle. There's a few, there's a few guests, not a lot. You get intimidated uh, by celebrities, though. I do. I bit. get nervous. I'm terrible at Q and A's. Like I, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, he asked about you a lot. <laughs> he didn't at all. <laughs> I cut that out. I didn't want to make you feel bad. <laughs> but where's Brian? <laughs> <laughs> you don't laugh at you don't laugh as much as that other fellow does <laughs> it's sort of boring talking to you <laughs> where's the joy where's the love <laughs> yes exactly um. <laughs> uh, and and speaking of the joy and the love uh you don't know where you're going to be well i guess we're, we're we're recording this close enough to when this comes out that we can probably talk about what the next episode of the or the most recent episode of the director's wall is right the other show you host we... with aj gonzalez <laughs> where you talk about a filmmaker's full filmography and you're currently doing francis ford coppola and we finally actually did tucker it happened (laughs) it is out this very week that this episode airs so i know for the last 25 years i've said that was the the future prediction we actually hit it it actually has happened uh we recorded it yesterday uh and it's now out well when you're hearing this episode you can actually go find that episode it's it's available uh, Tucker man is the man in his dream. So it, it, we've accomplished the impossible. You didn't think it could happen. It happened. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so what, 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 what's next up after Tucker? Uh, New York stories. Oh yes. New York we're, stories. We're still kind of like, we're in this transition period. We're about to we go into yeah. Coppola getting big with again with Godfather three and uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, so it's like it's it's going to be very exciting. Uh, we're, there's not a lot left. I think there's only six movies left, and then we're on to the next director. Mm. Yeah. So we've have you considered been... Dave Dakota? <laughs> that guy has too many movies. <laughs> there's so many of those movies he's done in the last fifteen years of just like all the dudes. With no shirts on, like you're hanging around with Bigfoot. I don't know what they're called. It's like a number. Do you know what I'm talking about? Nope. Oh, he's there's a there's a lot of those, and they look great, but it's a lot. That guy just makes too many movies. <laughs> and we'd be stuck doing him for like t- ten years, which is fine. <laughs> but I don't know. I think we're gonna do Russ Meyer. Uh, Russ Meyer. I don't know. <laughs> I do love Russ Meyer, but I'm just uh... gonna keep throwing out names of people you're not gonna do. <laughs> No. Yeah, well, who, we'll, we'll who, it'll all be revealed when we get. Okay. There's still, a, there's still, the rate we're going. There's still another, yeah, that's you know, like two years from two years of Coppola. So, yeah. Okay, I just want to know when you're gonna get to the to the Rainmaker. Uh, soon, and you will be our guest. So, I can't it will, wait like, for I that. think we're about four, four or five movies away. Three. Okay, I'll clear three some. Away. I'll clear some schedule in 2023. <laughs> yeah, August 12th, 2023. Uh, I might be busy that day. Uh, okay. Got a Van Halen concert to go to. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't really have a lot to to promote. I have some stuff, some fun stuff happening in, in 2022, um, mostly having to do with 
re-releasing a bunch of my music and getting it available. So I'll be announcing that when that's fun. when we get close to that. And we have some creative endeavors that you and I are going to be uh, attempting. Yeah, attempting, and we'll see where that gets to. So you know, more on that. You know, but just tease it. There's going to be some exciting, exciting stuff going on in 2023. Uh, one thing we can talk about is you're going to be releasing a film called Make, Make Popular, Popular Movies. Movies. Some somewhere next year, it'll be playing at a theater near you at a festival, your little art house theater. Me in the back of a van with a TV. Who knows? But that yeah, the hope is to spread the word on that movie. Yeah. Uh, well, right now I'm pretty excited about what's going on with the sleeping negro the film that skinner myers directed uh skinner listeners will remember skinner from our noscars episode and from our chameleon street episode by the way chameleon street has been re-released and uh yeah, it's because of us, right, Brian? I mean, obviously. <laughs> no, I don't think so, but sure. <laughs> uh, right place, the right time. Right place, the right time. We're, yeah. We were on, we had our we had our finger on the pulse, and yeah. you know why we had our finger on the pulse? Because we're friends with Skinner Myers, and he was like, "You should do a do a, an episode about Chameleon Street." And then he went off and finished his film, The Sleeping Negro, which I was lucky enough to be able to play a small role in uh, producing, and so I. I have a production credit on this film, which is amazing because it uh, let's I'm reading from the text he sent me last night about all the different things because it's have been getting so many accolades. I can't even keep track of them. It won a Fipresi Prize at the International Film Festival Mannheim Heidelberg in Germany and just won the Visionary Award at Cinequest Film Festival. Art Matten is the North American distributor, and Sudu Connexion is their interna- international distributor. They're currently playing in theaters in Atlanta and will be opening in more cities in the months to come. Festival-wise, they're playing in Warsaw, Poland next week, Berlin, and also in Texas next month. So look Ooh. out for that, Brian. Uh, I wonder be- where in Texas... I should find out. I, wh- why don't I have this information? I'm one of the producers. <laughs> uh, they're going to be in San Francisco in February and in the Man- in Manchester, UK in March. Uh, That's so great. It's, the, it's it's a it's a whew, a powerhouse of a film. Way you know I I, I want to cover it, but I just don't feel like I have the film cinematic vocabulary. His it's his. Every time I hang out with Skinner, I feel dumb because he's always talking about Tarkovsky, and I haven't dug into my Tarkovsky Ooh, enough yet. You got it. I know. Tarkovsky's good. I got a bi- I'm, I'm actually <laughs> staying someplace where I've got a big screen TV now, and I, there's films. Like, I want to be immersed. When I watch a, a film with subtitles, I want to be immersed in it. Otherwise, he- I get distracted, and it's annoying. So... And his yeah. movies are very immersive, and like, it actually isn't a lot of talking in a lot of them. Like, Stalker... It's pretty quiet, but man, that movie really, at least for me, really pulls you in. Like, it's very, he's one of my favorite filmmakers, so if Well, you Skinner and Skinner would have a great conversation. <laughs> like, but definitely be awake, because it's some slow, slow movies. <laughs> no, Brian, I'm always but... awake. I'm always awake. <laughs> that's yeah, no, But that's great that, about Skinner. I keep seeing stuff about his movie. Uh, on like Instagram and online and like even just like IMDb news and stuff. So it's like it's really exciting when a guest we have or a friend is uh, doing so well with their film because it's really hard. It's so hard through every part of the process to get a movie made and out there and seen and getting to the point where even like winning awards is fantastic and thrilling. Yeah, I really hope it means that he gets to make more movies because this, you know, as someone who's made films with no budget you know he's in the same boat that you were with your film and just the hope is that he gets to work with a significantly larger budget next time and yeah. see what he can do when he really has the reins of a production so yeah good yeah. job skinner we're very <laughs> very happy for you and uh, you know proud to have played a small role here on The World is Wrong in introducing you to the wider world. <laughs> We're going to take credit for everything, Brian. <laughs> Someday we may be right. Chameleon Street, uh, <laughs> uh, Sleeping Negro, 
uh, Mad Dog yeah. Time. Nothing but trouble. Just Nothing came but out trouble. on Blu-ray a month oh, ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we look for there's I, there's a state of grace resurgence coming, man. There's there's a reckoning. <laughs> First of all, you need to see it. But uh, after that, <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 no, yeah. So uh, yeah, well, if you if you've enjoyed this if you enjoy this show, then you probably know that this is the point where I tell you that if you've enjoyed this show, you can find us at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can find us on Instagram at theworldiswrongpodcast and on Twitter at worldiswrongpod. And you can write to us at contact at theworldiswrongpodcast.com, which uh, really not nearly enough of you do. I think if you're the type of person who makes a New Year's resolution, one of your New Year's resolutions is should be to <laughs> not shut your stinking trap. To do the opposite <laughs> of shutting your stinking trap, you yeah. should send us send us letters and let us I know want, what you think of this. We want to we want to hear from you. Yeah, because it's weird doing a podcast. You just kind of make it. You put it out in the world, but there's no like audience. There's no live audience or interaction really. So like, I have no idea who's listening to this or what people think. So it'd be great to yeah hear. Hear from some people. You know who uh, I know who listens to this because uh, she comments on almost every Instagram post is Rhonda Bogman. Thanks, Rhonda. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you want to, yeah. if you want to be like Rhonda and have us say your name on the show, <laughs> be more consistent in letting us know what you think. Because yeah. we, this is this is a feedback loop, people. You know. Yeah. We're feeding it to you, and we want <laughs> you to feed it back to us. <laughs> I know it sounds a little gross, but <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a human centipede sort of thing. Going yeah, no, on, no, it's, <laughs> no, it's not like that at all. So, uh, yeah, any any last words on the new year? Do you want to, any 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 regrets from last year? Any things you're you're, you're proud of? Uh, no, I just need to start catching up on stuff for our Oscars. Like, I need to know yes, what movies do. are good that the Academy does not think are good, so we can have our show about it so i need to i definitely have a bunch of movies on my radar new stuff that i really want to see <clears throat> just so i can have you know my say in what i think was the best films of 2021 yeah yeah i had a conversation with your co-host uh from the director's wall aj gonzalez he's putting together his list I, th yeah. I think i think this oscars thing and i you know and maybe we can this is good we're, we're ending here for you for those of you who are listening to this and following along and i guess you wouldn't be hearing this if i if you weren't so why am i saying that you should start making your noscars lists what what film because i think it's a it's a great exercise because on the one hand it really takes the edge off of the films you love not getting nominated to know that now they are they qualify for this other thing <laughs> and i hope that you know if enough people uh send us their lists maybe we can find a way to include them in our uh in our yeah. oscars episode. listeners poll oscars yeah. awards yeah yeah so but it all starts with you sending us a letter or an email i guess we <laughs> we're not asking for letters we're not giving you an address send us an email uh a email laced with uh, anthrax and and we, 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 no one will get hurt by it because that's 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 the safest way to send your anthrax is through the email. And um, is that is that is that too dated a reference? You don't remember <laughs> the days when people were afraid of getting letters laced with anthrax? No, I think that's fresh. <laughs> that's a fresh thing. Okay, fresh enough. You know, it was, it was a traumatic thing in 2001, knowing that yeah. there were people getting anthrax letters. I'm still thinking about it. Or maybe I'm thinking about it because of the role anthrax plays in one of this year's sure-to-be nominees. But uh, I'll wait mm. for, you know, that's a little... It's, it's one of them. Oh. So oh. You, when, you, when you get to that point, when you get to the anthrax, you'll know it. Oh. Uh, so, uh, did that get you excited? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hmm, what... I'll leave you, leave you on that moment of excitement, anticipation, and dread. And <laughs> maybe that's the way to go into 2022. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, just uh, until, until next time, folks, just remember, don't, don't let it get you down. The world is wrong, and it's probably wrong about you. I can hear him, but I can't find him. Manson, 
You lift up this rock, and I'll try to swim up my knee. Ribbit, ribbit. I was raised in a prison. I don't know any other way. I like it. Prison's my mother. Come on. Quick, miss, run home and tell Mom and Dad that I'm bit. I've been bit, too, and I like it. The truth don't play no favorites. Bite on that, Jack. Hurry before the poison starts working in. Hurry, boy. When's dinner? I'm star. Hold your horses, mister. You got to walk it like you're talking. Wop, bop, bloop, bop, bop, bam, boom. Hush, Manson, I'm fixing dinner. I'll fix brain stew for dinner when I'm the cook, Jack. Shh. What has gotten into you, boy? And where's Timmy? Timmy? I don't know. I got the eye of the tiger, and I don't know who to kill first. Are you trying to tell us something, boy? You can lock me up, but you can't block me up. I'm so insane, I'm sane. Good Lord, he's trying to tell us Timmy's in trouble. What happened, boy? Did Timmy have an accident by the lake? Accident? There are no accidents. Don't give me that jive, Jack. There is only the plan, and everything else is jack -a <laughs> Timmy got bit by a snake. And, and the poison's gonna start working soon. Oh, we don't have time. We've got to get there. Show us the way. Show us the way, boy. Good boy. Dad, I was trying to catch a toad, and well, I thought he was under the rock. But... It's okay, Timmy. Manson told us all about it. Once we started listening to him, that is. If you don't listen, you don't hear. You can't hear nothing when your head's in a bag, Jack. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe by Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform.